Welcome to the midweek edition of the AM Show on Joy News TV, your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. This morning I woke up wondering, how do you keep sane or how do you stay afloat in this myriad of issues going on in this country? But that's why we are here to get the conversations going. Welcome to the AM Show. My name is Sweetie Abochi, and you know I do this with Benjamin Akapo. He'll be joining me shortly, but in a bit I will serve you the news. And then we'll get into the news review. For today, Dr. Sasante, the head of European studies at the University of Ghana, will be joining us for the news review. And after that, AM Sports coming your way with Muftal Nabila Abdullah bringing you the latest chronicles. And then we get into our big stories. Now, PULC has bitten hard at ECG as a failing to publish a load management timetable and peddling falsehood about the cost of the erratic power supply between the period of January to March 2024, including other breaches. Now, PURC is saying, therefore, that they've handed a hefty fine of 5.8 million Ghana cities to be paid by the board members of ECG. What does this really mean for the power sector in the wake of this teething power crisis? We'll delve into that issue later on in the show. Also, LPG Workers Association and the OMCs reject an $80 levy by the NPA, describing it as an insensitive and a um, indecisive to the household use of LPG. We hear from the stakeholders. And then again later on the show, the leadership of the Concerned Drivers Association called the bluff of the Transport Ministry, daring the police to arrest them for increasing their transport fares by 20%. We will engage them as well. You realize that all these issues are connected in some way. So we'll bring you an analysis of the real situation on ground. Join us with your comments, with your thoughts, by phone or via social media on Joy News TV. And let's get the conversation started. My name is Sweetie Abochi, and I'll be serving the news in just a bit. Stay with me. Welcome to the program. This is the AM News. Let's begin with the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission has declared that the Electricity Company of Ghana peddled falsehood when it claimed the recent intermittent power outages was due to overloaded transformers across the country. The ECG has always insisted the recent power outages is not to do so, but challenges with faulty transformers, explaining they were on a nationwide drive to repair those transformers. But in its latest regulatory order directed at the ECG, PURC says its analysis of data submitted by the ECG itself points to the fact that only three plant outages were related to transformers, and the outages were actually as a result of load management operations undertaken by Gridco. Listen to Managing Director of the ECG, Samuel Dubik Mahama, as he tells Evans Mensa last month about these claims of overloaded transformers. Thing is intact. And our customers are enjoying a very stable power supply as we speak. As you know, we distribute what we get. So from the upstream, when there are any disturbances from the upstream, it actually affects our job on the downstream side. At the beginning of every year, there's, there's some maintenance that comes into play. I remember very well somewhere last year, it was uh, Ghana Gas that had to shut down for some maintenance and we had to make preparation for the purchase of some uh, liquid fuels to keep the power up. This year, what we have suffered is mostly on the low voltage side, which is, has to do with ECG. Um, especially in the Shanti region area, we had a lot of underground cables exploding due to the heat that we've experienced over, the, the, over this uh, period. What then happened was these underground cables have high voltage, so we had to replace some of them. And when you're trying to replace them, by the time you realize you get to a place, there's a building on the underground cable. So you now need to have to rework and rewire your whole plan to see how you can join it through a different spot. On the other side, we have been experiencing a lot of overloads on most on a lot of our transformers within lots and lots of localities. Um, I have always said that the next big conversation that we are going to be having, saying there's do so, there's do so. The do so that we are never we are going to experience is not going to be on the side of let's say lack of generation, but what we are experiencing now is mostly on um, overloads. At peak, 
we have come to realize that a lot of our, what do you call them, a lot of our transformers have been, have a lot of customers on them more than what we have prescribed. Going through our system, there's a, there's a requisite, there's a required way of doing it. We actually do 10 of the transformer before customers are loaded. But when you check through our SCADA systems, you don't even find out when those transformers were turned off for people to be loaded. I say this because if it hadn't been for the issues that we experienced in Somenia and in Kroboland with our customers, we wouldn't have even known that uh, local electricians had a way of onboarding people onto transformers without our knowledge. Meanwhile, some members of the public have expressed support for the PRC's decision to impose a fine of 5.8 million Ghana CDs on board members of the ECG for its failure or refusal to publish a load management timetable. To me, I think it is fair because it's your responsibility and you fail to do it. And it's like they've been partial to you and they've given you um, a fine to pay. So I think it's fair. A lot of people's things have been spoiled. But the fine that they are, they are supposed to pay, I don't think it can make up for the, the things that they've sport. But um, since that they are, it's legal, they've been legally fined, I think it's, it's, it's good. It's good because um, it's like they are giving justice to those whose things have been sport. Yeah. I want to ask ECG, the prepaid and then the postpaid that I've been paying, what do they use the money for? Because we've been buying prepaid, and here is the case, um, our lights normally go, so there is light off. So what do they use the money for? What brought about the debts? It's fair, they should pay, because, yes, they should pay, and then they should involve us. They should pay, they should give us light, but they should pay, because the lights and the people we've be, been buying, what do they use the money for? If, if they had used the money wise, there wouldn't be any debts. I feel, I feel like it's fair, yeah, because they, they, are, they are supposed to publish the... The schedule out and they didn't do that so they have to pay that to compensate what they've done like what, what they didn't do let me put it that way it's, it's i think it's fair they pay that money because if i said they should add some that means it will you know come from us we that we are buying the prepaid yeah so that's how it goes so it's okay for them for now yeah to be good for them to add some because they are punishing us a lot okay i think they have to add some to it they will pay the thing that they do, I don't understand them. Uh, uh, so it's worth some. You pay, yes. Uh. Repairs and thousands of CDs lost in discarded fish and meat products. That is the story of cold store operators as the erratic power supply continued to bite harder on businesses. Today on our Doomsaw Diaries, James Aveji takes us to the Malata Market in Accra, where cold store operators count their losses to the Doomsaw situation as they call on government to produce a timetable on the outages. Here's this report. I'm here in the heart of Malata Market in Accra to explore the Doomsaw Diary of operators of frozen food shops, your popular cold stores. The buzzing business of buying and selling is the demand for frozen foods fish, meat, and others. At least today, the lights are on in the market, but operators of these coal stores, just like you and I, have been battling a peculiar problem in the past few months. Doom so. They need, need to be honest with us on this power issue. They can turn off the lights early in the morning and bring it back very late in the evening. Why are they not being forthcoming with us? If it's not to do so, then what is it? Chocho, -cho, one of the owners of the cold stores here, tells me on several occasions she has had to dispose of some products which went bad because of the unstable power supply. The cost of the fish has also gone up. The ones we used to buy for 100 cities now sells for between 400 to 600 cities. The moment the fish becomes tender, no one wants to buy them. We are usually left with no option than to dispose of the cold foods that have gone bad. We are pleading with government to resolve the power crisis. Another trader just says, three weeks ago, when the doomsaw became intense, 
tens of cartons of fish and meat products in his cold room went bad, running into loss of thousands of cities. The last time I threw... How many, what's the amount? Amount. Yes. Wow. You know, our chicken cutting is 320. 20 cities per one cutting. The last time I threw about 10 boxes away. Yeah. And the fishes? The fish, the salmon to a cutting is 1,000. Uh, 1030 30 cities. We threw about four or five away because of all the smell and the sport. Yeah. Did you have to, I mean, after that, what happens? You have to bear the cost, you move on, you buy a new one, and then you, you start? That one, the uh, cost time. So far, that one is for you have to put different money into the business again. So we can't blame the government to come and give us any money now. So it's our business. Another cost the coastal managers bear is the purchase of spare parts to repair their gadget, which now breaks down consistently due to the flickering power. The moment the light starts going off and on, it damages our machines. And these machines are expensive to repair. We are always incurring losses. At this point, I grew interest in why Chocho and Aja are unable to provide alternative parts to protect their investment. Do you have generator you use for your... I do not have a generator as a backup because I sell at the market. It is an open space. The noise from the generator will disturb traders and customers. Not that we can't buy a generator, but where we are now, we don't have a space here to mount that generator at us now. But in the middle of all this, Aja says officials of the ECG have visited their shops to already inform them about a possible bill increment. How much approximately do you pay in a month? This is prepaid. This is prepaid. Yeah, and so you can you, uh, buy 1,000, 5, 2,000. 1,000, 5, 2,000 in a month. Yeah. I mean, but uh, we've seen some communications that the ECG is asking for more increment on the bill. Yeah, it's true. They even came here. They came here? Yeah. Oh, okay. But we, our good room, if they break, we off it. In the even they on it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if they increase the bill, but there is no doom saw or light out, would you be willing to pay? Oh, yeah, yeah. If there's no doom saw or light out, the business is going on, we can pay whatever we get. The two are united in the demand for a shadow to cut the lost. We are pleading with government to provide a doomso timetable, as was done during John Mahama's regime. That's the least we can ask for. If there is a timetable about Dumso, we all know that by this day the lights will go off. You have to arrange yourself. You will go and take plenty of goods down before lights will go out. So you know what you take before the Dumso will come. They hope stakeholders, including the ECG, Gridco, and government, gives a listening ear to them and finds solutions to rescue their businesses. From Malata Market here in Accra, James Kwesia Veji on today's episode of Doomso Diaries for Joy News. So there you have it. But again on the energy front, some drivers have confirmed they are already charging new transport fares, contrary to the Ministry of Transport's directive. Driver unions across the country have proposed at least a 30% increase on transport fares, citing rising petrol prices and cost of spare parts. But before, P uh, before the GPRT and government could reach an agreement, some drivers say they are already charging at least 20% on all transport fares. It's not fair. It's not fair, but because we have not, uh, we have not been authorized to increase fares. 
So I think anybody who increases the fare is illegal. So I think the law must deal with that person, uh, that union or that organization until we hear from the right authorities. They should give us some fine percentage so that we, 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 we increase because things have gone up. The petrol is high, the spare parts are also high. So our expectation is that uh, they should give us, give us a fair, uh, fair, fair deal. The need to arrest them. They cannot increase the fares when there hasn't been any official communication from authorities. When it happens that way, there will be inconsistency in the system. When it's by fuel, we can buy spare parts. But your car owners will be expecting you to make huge sales to them. That is why we increase the fares. We run at a loss every single day. Oh, they have been there and you have crossed out about the chicken because patrol you have two months more than two years. You have two months. They say 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 you have two months. Because Away from that, the leader of Ghana Environmental Advocacy, Elizabeth Aluava, is demanding immediate actions by the traditional leaders in the Nzema enclave and other parts of the country to speak against the activities of irresponsible mining in their areas. According to her, some few children in the areas have died in pits left uncovered by illegal miners in the Enzima area, a situation she describes as unfortunate. These angry Enzima residents are unhappy about the rate at which illegal miners are causing destruction to forests and water bodies in their enclave. They mounted placards with different inscriptions preaching the disadvantage and health implication of illegal mining in the area. Elizabeth Eluava, leader of the Ghana Environmental Advocacy, a group of young people living in Nzema and other parts of the country, indicated at a press conference that almost all river bodies in the Nzema enclave of the western region have been polluted by illegal miners. She is unhappy security agencies in the country and political heads have refused to deal with the issue and urging the traditional leaders in the Nzema area who are the last hope to take immediate actions to prevent these illegal miners. Responsible surface mining has destroyed our forests, land and rivers and continues to pose an existential threat to us and not be overemphasized. At this point, even the only stranger in Jerusalem is aware of the risks we face. Why then can't we stand together with one voice and destroy this evil? So why then are we in Ghana and Zemers, Wasas, Seishis, Ashantis, Fantis, Elves, Dagombes, etc.? Why are we running headlong to our death? Enough is enough. To send this message to our esteemed Nananum, who as custodians of the land are the last protectors of our lands, forests and rivers, that we cannot let this continue. Even if our political leaders have let us down, they Nananum are our last hope. According to her, many citizens in the country are now drinking and eating mercury and other harmful chemicals 
due to these irresponsible mining and diseases associated with these harmful chemicals in just herald of what's before our unborn generation. She added that already a few children in the area have died in pits left uncovered by illegal miners, a situation she described as unfortunate. Today, many of us in Egira, which is Jura, Enzoma, Awoyin, Sefi, Wasa, and Ashante are drinking mercury and lead laden water. We are eating tubers, fruits and fishes that have been contaminated with poisonous heavy metals. The resulting increase in diseases associated with mercury, lead, arsenic, and cyanide poisoning is just a herald to what will befall our unborn generations. Already, a few have died in open pits in our communities. Four in Inkrofo, two in Anya, and one in Telekubokazo. Do their deaths mean anything to you, Nanano? Our cocoa production has reduced, and whatever little we have left will soon be tagged as contaminated with heavy metals. Isn't that concerning enough? We demand action. We need action. We know the excellent work of, of some of our gallant traditional leaders. For Joy News in Athalia, Kwanza, Western Region. Now, in other stories, parliamentary candidate for Ibra Asibu Kwamankese, Felix Kwache Ofosu, has commissioned and upgraded two health facilities in the Ibra Asibu Kwamankese constituency. The maternity wards of the health facilities had deteriorated, with the medical equipment of the facilities outdated. Speaking at the handing over of the facility, he expressed the hope that the facility, now furnished with modern equipment, will serve communities better. There's more in this report. I must emphasize that I got volunteers, some of them who were masons, carpenters, electricians, painters, who volunteered their skills. And it is through that effort that we are able to deliver this beautiful maternity ward that you are seeing. They are filled with modern equipment that will rival any equipment that you will see anywhere in Ghana, including the teaching hospitals. NDC parliamentary candidate for the Abra Sebu Kwamankese constituency, Felix Kwachio Fosu, handing over the facilities to the two communities in his constituency. The former Deputy Minister for Communications lamented that the facility had faced neglect by authorities to the point that residents shied away from patronizing them. And I can see the midwife and her staff beaming with smiles because of the sheer relief that we have brought to them. Indeed, incidentally, as we walked in, I understand that there was a case where a lady was delivering. So perhaps that is the first baby to have been delivered with this, this new equipment that I have brought in and after the place was rehabilitated. These are temporary interventions. Indeed, it is the duty of governments to respond to such concerns. But the problem we have in AAK is that for eight years, the MPP has simply turned a blind, a blind eye and deaf ears to the needs of the people. They do not seem to appreciate the mandate that was bestowed upon them. They are taking the people of Mori and AAK for granted and do not appear prepared to do what they need to do in order to uplift the living standards of the people here. By the way, on our way here to, we stopped over at a place called Courtyard, which essentially is a major debate ground where all manner of activities are held in Mori. It was also in a very poor shape. So we can't sort for the construction of a new and modern uh, their background, which we hope to finish in the coming months. The midwife at the facility, Joanna Krapa, expressed the hope that with the refurbishment of the place, the residents who lost interest in the facility because of its deteriorating nature would begin to patronize the facility. If the facility had all the necessary um, uh, things that we, we need, but it has deteriorated. Something like the Louvre place, like this, when it rains, the rain comes indoors, sometimes the corridor and here. And also, we have three delivery beds. One was functioning, but the other two was not functioning. Uh -huh. So he brought us new two beds and also a modern uh, bed scale, which is over there, a modern one. 
That one is can take the measurement of the baby. That's the full length, the weight, and the height. Previously, we have to use the manual way. We use the tape measure that the, mid, uh, the seamstress uses to measure for sewing breasts. That is what we use for the babies. But now the one that we have, it can be used for the baby. The gesture was preceded by a float through the principal streets of the beneficiary communities, funded and organized by a former parliamentary aspirant of the Abra Sebu Kwamankese constituency, Ekuagri, Minority Leader. Dr. Casey Latuforsen and other NDC regional and national executives graced the events. Well, it's a wrap for the AM News. Dr. Kwame Asasanti joins us for the newspaper review. Keep watching. <laughs> Well, it's time for us to get into the newspapers and see what the news are and how it resonates with us. Benjamin Akako has taken his seat in his... <laughs> what's the color of your suit? It's coffee. Coffee? Mm-hmm. Benjamin Akako. Coffee. <laughs> anyway, how are you feeling this morning? Did the rain uh, uh, disrupt yeah. your plans? Uh, a bit. Okay. Um, but it was okay. I, I woke up this morning a tad tired and right. the weather wasn't helping and right. everything in there. But it was okay. I mean, the heat, the heat has been massive. At a point last night, my lights went out briefly okay. and came back on okay. uh, uh, twice. But at least I must be fair to the ECG. Yeah. It didn't last long. Okay. So at least I got to get um, a good night's rest and we're here. It's a I, Wednesday I, I, morning. I would prefer this over the heat any day. I prefer the rains yeah. over. It, we yeah. experienced some heat wave that nearly drove me crazy. So Yo, by all means, yeah, at least it, it you didn't get there for some people. <laughs> and you know, throughout this period, yeah. those I have felt for the most. Do you know? Who? Those who hawk on the road. Charlie. By the sides of the road and all of that. It's partly because of a failed system. Yeah. Because we shouldn't have so many people hawking. I mean, we shouldn't have people hawking along our roads, but the economic situation, people trying to eke out a living, and, you know, every time I pass by, sometimes the heat is so bad, your AC is turned on full throttle, and you're still feeling hot, and you're imagining, and you know, you can see, when you look outside, you can see how bright the sun is shining, and you're asking yourself, wow, that's someone's sister, someone's mother, someone's brother, someone's father out there just to make a living. And there's something called heat stroke or sunstroke. <clears throat> if you expose yourself to too much heat at certain temperatures, and if you don't properly hydrate, you could suffer sunstroke. And they're exposing themselves to this. You know, but so... What can they do? That's the whole... I, I mean, what I'm not... But, but I can't help but feel for them when the sun is blazing like that. And Yeah. Yeah. But um, joining us today is Dr. Kwame Asante for the News Review. Dr. Kwame Asante, welcome to the program. How are you feeling this morning? Good morning. I'm well. Great. Yes. Very Before well. we get into it, please let me acknowledge Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. Right, go and ahead. then yes. we shall get Great. right into it. So before we uh, usher in Dr. Kwame Asante, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, helping us bring you uh, this segment there actually offering you, if you're a man, prostate screening gratis for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening for free as well. There are many branches they have. Let's start with Accra. They had Spintex opposite the Shell signboard. Kumasi, Kronomabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takra De Anaji State, Tema Community 22, Tichiman Hanswa, and Isiyama Their call lines 0244 867 068 or 274 234 Three, two, one. End point homeopathic clinic. The, the end, end to chronic, to chronic disease. disease. You, you couldn't help it, did, <laughs> no, could you? You, you, you just had to join on that. Jump on it. Okay, so let's well. take it away with Dr. Kwame Asante. Yes, Doc. So what's on your mind this morning before we get into what the papers are saying? Yes, uh, today I'll touch on something briefly. And I want to look at, uh, I want to commend NCA and commend um, a ministry of uh, communication and then all the stakeholders 
who have made it possible for us to communicate one more time effectively. You recall a few weeks ago, we woke up only to realize that our lines were down. We could not make calls. We could not do anything. And um, uh, they put their acts together. And today, yes, uh, we are getting uh, service and um, it's good. Um, I will want to urge them that next time around, uh, if there is any alternative to what they exist, they should explore that before we come to uh, the last time, the last moment where we are in distress. But uh, so far, I think that uh, they, 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 they deserve some commendation from us uh, because they've done a good work. It is my hope and prayer uh, that they will be able to maintain and see things ahead and plan and plan well. But so far, so good. Right. Thank you for that. Keeping it brief and succinct. Let's get into the Daily, Gra Daily Graphic newspaper for a start. I have put some ginger into my stomach this morning. I think it's making... <laughs> it's, it's bringing out things that shouldn't yes, come it's out. it's bringing yeah. out things that shouldn't come out. Right. right. So on the front page of the Daily Graphic, it says 2024 Green Ghana Day launched. 10 million trees to be planted. PULC finds ECG. 5.86 million Ghana cities for service delivery breaches. Odal Basin, bridges causing floods to be removed. And former Maslock boss jailed 10 years in absentia. So let's get into the first story that is 2024 Green Ghana Day launched. Um, yesterday, the Minister for Land and Natural Resources, Abu Jinapo, launched this year's Green Ghana Day project with a call on citizenry to commit to come together to plant and grow at least 10 million trees for a greener tomorrow for the survival of generations to come. Green Ghana Day is an extraordinary opportunity for us all to contribute to make our country greener and habitable and forever shall it be. That is a quote from the minister. Before you come in, Benjamin, can we achieve... How, how did you know I wanted to say something? Because oh, so Manu, when, Manu you, when you go this way, this I know you're about to get it. <laughs> Manu so, yeah. Is it, can um, we achieve this? 10 million trees. Um, it's not about the numbers. Mm. And, and that's why, for me, when you look at something like the performance tracker, I'll be very brief. It's, it's problematic and it's symptomatic of propaganda mm. and the political game we play. Actually, if that performance tracker, we got it right, like I've said, and not just even limited to one administration, but we had a system like that, it would, it would serve a very good purpose. Unfortunately, we are trying to do the right thing in the wrong way. Okay. Now, coming back to this, I have a few questions. Okay. For the last how many years, do you know the number of te the tens of millions we have expended on this green Ghana day? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say this, but Obina contract, and so no, no. That's someone's contract. Mm -hmm. Some people's contract. How much is a tree? or the seedling, or the sapling, how much is it worth? How many have we planted? How many have survived? How much have we put into it? I mean, when you go around town, how much greenery do you see? And I'm not just talking about a crowd. When you go around town, how much do you see? In addition to all of this, look at what Galam said. Do you know that we are slowly losing our status as the country with the premium cocoa? I remember in Cuba, 20... 2012, or was it? Yeah. I was so happy because I entered this shop in um, one, of the, one of the provinces. I've forgotten the name. And in there, they had, I think they said, 40% premium cocoa from Ghana as a part of the mix, a bar of chocolate. I bought that bar of chocolate because Ghana was representing right, right, right there. Mm -hmm. We are slowly losing our status. Cocoa Bot has been talking about that. So... Though this Green Ghana Day is on a different front, I'm saying, how much have we really gained? Our forest cover over the last how many years? We've lost it at an alarming rate. Galamse is in there. We claim we are doing this, and, and I can't even see what the real... You know, it should be palpable, right? Tens of millions every year. Where are the results? I mean, th those are my quick reflections. Right. That's how I come I think um, Ben has said it all. Mm. I'll add something few to it. Uh, because the question is, are we ready to have green environment? I'm not sure we are ready. Uh, because today, we still have practices where uh, we fell trees. And uh, 
it doesn't affect anybody nobody is busy uh, nobody is bothered about that um ben has said it right we have spent so much and continue to spend have we achieved anything it is not a matter of growing the trees but do you maintain it do you have that culture of maintaining the tree ensuring that they grow and grow well now, what can we show that uh, in terms of trees we planted this is what we can show i mean there is no point planting and you will not maintain and there is also no point planting and at the end of the day you encourage the existing one to be fell anyhow no uh planning uh, is required here we need to get certain bases right and we need to what make sure that what we put state money in we ensure value for money that's all uh this country uh, as soon as we lay hands on some money we throw it out there as ben said somebody is somebody's contract so he will benefit from it so he doesn't care hoot about what comes at the end of the day but mind you it's public money that we are just wasting it like that Mm. Uh, if we want to fix the problems of this country, we must start from things like this. Uh, now, we are talking about harsh, you know, environmental conditions we are seeing today. Uh, part of it is due to the way we abuse the environment. We have no trees to serve as windbreaks, and any time it rains, we are, we are, we are desperate. We are, we are hot. We, mm. we are in, in problems. Mm. And uh, how do we get this thing fixed? we need to what, get the basics right. And we need to be patriotic and know that, look, it is our country we are building, no, not anybody else country. It is our country. We want to build it for ourselves, our children, and our children's children. That is all. Right. I have a message coming through. Uh, Abdul says, good morning. Have we accounted for the thousands of trees we planted before enrolling this new phase? That's his question. Yes, because this is not the first time we're launching Green Diamond. No, no. Yeah, we've been doing it. This is about the, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, maybe the fourth or fifth. I mean, yes. the story could confirm for yeah. us, but, but I know this has been going on for, for quite yeah. a while. Okay, but let's get into um, other stories. This, I believe, we are all familiar with. PRC fines ECG 5.8 million Ghana cities for service delivery breaches. And I think the story is in our news this morning when we brought back Dubik Mahama waxing lyrical about how it is the transformers that are causing the erratic power outages. And then we also brought back reactions of people saying that uh, it's a good thing that they're fine, that they should pay. They should not share the, 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 that debt or that you know, fine on the ordinary citizen. They no, but the PRC told them. Yeah. So they have fined the ECG some... The company itself. Some, I think... Tens of thousands, right? right. That, is, that is chicken fee, mm. chicken change. But the main people are the ones who have been fined 5.8 million. Yeah. But honestly, I mean, it's, it's a hefty sum. Oh, they should pay. They have the money. Hey. Dr. Kwame Asakhan, <laughs> what do you think about this story? I think we, we, it's part of our big stories this morning. We'll get into that. But what do you think? I listened to Dr. Mantia this morning okay. on your network. And uh, I think I agree with him that uh, politics will definitely come in. Uh, because those who are put on the board are appointees of government, and then uh, you will not want to see um, institutions, two institutions of state, fighting, sort of. Uh, so uh, when matter gets worse, um, government will step in, and then um, nothing will happen. Um, this attitude about ECG, uh, not ready, uh, to be honest about the situation on the ground, I find it so strange. I mean, so strange. We are experiencing doom, so, mm. but for some political reasons, you don't want to accept that. How long can you continue to lie to public? I mean, if people sit behind their uh, machines and in their homes and do undertake illegal connections, do you want it? You want them to be forthright, to be truthful to you about what is happening so that you can take a decision. Why are they pretending as if there is nothing happening? Um, these things will not change the minds of people towards what they have said before and what they are saying now. Uh, we are just waiting for appropriate time that the good people of this country will factor these things as part of the things that influence their choices come December 7. They should note this. I'm not sure they are oblivious of this fact. If that is the case, then uh, they are novices within the system. That's all that I will see. 
Right. But before we get into an international story um, in the Daily Graphic, I want to do the story about the former Maslock boss jailed 10 years in absentia. So yesterday, the High Court sentenced this former boss of fi uh, microfinance and small loan center, Sedina Tamaklo Atiyonu, and a former operations manager of the organization, Daniel Exim, to 10 years and five years in prison, <coughs> respectively, for causing financial loss of 90 million Ghana cities to the state. And this was after the court presided over by Justice Ifia Sewa Saributri, a court of appeal judge sitting with additional responsibility as a high court judge, found the two guilty of 78 counts of causing financial loss to the state, stealing, conspiracy to steal, money laundering, and causing loss to public property in contravention of the public procurement. Now, the case, it was a case of the prosecution <coughs> led by the principal state attorney, Stella Ohenia Pia, that the two stole 3.19 million Ghana cities while at Maslock and willfully caused 1.97 million Ghana cities financial loss to the state. Again, they were accused of making unauthorized commitments resulting in financial obligations for government to the tune of 61.7 million Ghana cities. So the charges against the two included 22.1 million <coughs> loss of public property, improper payment of 273,743 million Ghana cities, and laundering of 3.7 million Ghana cities. Ben, are you familiar with the story? I am very familiar with um, the story. <clears throat> I followed it over time, and I'm very happy with the result. Yeah. Because, I mean, you look at the tail of the tape. Some, in law, sometimes your actions also depict whatever may be happening with you or whatever you may have done. Sedina Tamiklo said she was traveling abroad for, and, and this was given because of medical reasons, and, and she refuses to return. Of course, the COO has been in the fray. I heard the Deputy Attorney General say that he was happy with the ruling of the court. I've followed the story extensively. There's an instance where I think they gave a loan to somebody mm. of about, is it 500,000, mm. and they wanted 24% back. Mm -hmm. When the person refused, they said there had to be a refund. Yeah. The, the entity did refund the money, mm -hmm. yet never really get, th got that back. money never got back yes. to Maslock. Yeah. So the COO and Sedina, uh, you know, Tamaklo, Kept that. There was another instance of, I think, over a million Ghana cities, which was meant to be distributed to certain people, and the distribution was only done. I mean, it was a paltry sum that was given out. When you look at it, obviously, the court has ruled in absentia. If she feels she's not guilty, she should come and make a case. But at this point in time, she's been, you know, unless there's an appeal uh, in terms of the ruling. But people who do this, at least per the ruling of the court, the reasoning of the court, must face the full rigors of the law. You, you can't be doing this. And I don't know how long she'll be in, uh, I mean, <laughs> roaming out there without coming back. Though, just to end, uh, the, the, I think it's the Deputy Attorney General or the Attorney General himself who said that they were going to uh, initiate extradition processes. In other words, trying to get her back yes. into the country to face uh, yes. the music. So I'm completely fine with this development something and I, I wish it happened yesterday. more often yeah more often mm. something i read yesterday on the case that when you have an educated thief it causes more havoc than when a person carrying ak-47 but over to you dr the Bonner educated Bonner. thieves are the worst yeah mm. no um, yes the ruling we heal the ruling mm. it's a good one uh if you read our constitution it said leaders uh, uh, must be answerable for their actions and inactions. So it talks about uh, probity, accountability. We are accountable. So when a public office is entrusted in your care and then you are in charge, you need to discharge your work uh, with diligence so that at the end of the day, when the times come for you to render account, you can do that. Um, if you look at the whole story, uh, it gives you an idea that there was something missing. Right. Mm. And um, uh, if you look at the details of the story, where uh, Cantamanto, uh, people who uh, the fire victims and the rest of them, you know, were denying what is due them and all that. At the end of the day, you cannot say, but only to praise the judgment as nothing but what an up, what, uh, you know, delivery of justice uh, to the doorstep of the people of this country. We want. Uh, more of this, 
and then we want to make sure that public office, uh, when you go there, you proceed with integrity. Right. Let me do one last story in the Daily Graphic, and then we can move on. Three countries join Africa to African uh, to recall um, the JNJ cough syrup. Yeah, okay. So three countries join African <coughs> recall of JNJ cough syrup. The story is on page five. Drug regulators in Tanzania, Rwanda, and Zimbabwe have recalled a batch of Johnson & Johnson new tab children's cough syrup as a precautionary measure after their Nigerian counterpart said laboratory tests found high levels of toxicity. The countries join Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa in recalling the same batch of the syrup, which is used to treat coughs, hay fever, and other allergic reactions in children. This has been going on since 2022 or 2023. I remember doing a story back at my you know, former media house mm. on this recall of drugs because it was causing some serious harm to children. And so I'm just happy that more African countries are joining the call to recall this and I mean, how long will it take before we get it completely off the market? But any quick reactions to this before we move on, Dr. Kwame Asasi? Yeah, my question is, has, it, has this particular uh, syrup entered Ghana? Ah. I want to find out. Mm -hmm. If it has, what effort are people also doing uh, to get this thing out of the system? Mm. Yeah, that is my biggest question for them. Uh, because... Um, looking at our borders and security and all that mm. people find a way of what outwitting the system and bringing illegal you know goods oh. into our system only to come and harm society so uh, we should take steps to also make sure that we don't have this particular uh, uh, syrup here if it's already here there must be effort to get it out of the system i haven't heard anything about ghana making any statement or you know, of anything of the sort. But, I mean, I agree with you. If it has entered the country, we should ensure that our children's lives are protected. Well, I, I know there are different types of that um, syrup, so uh, we also have to wait and see what happens. And the FDA uh, and all are in there. So we'll see how things turn out. Let's get into the Ghanaian Times newspaper. Some of these stories have been done already. Reforestation, Green Ghana Day, um, there's also the former mass lock bar situation. So I'll focus on two other stories. One, and I'm sure you'd be pretty interested in this, on page three, Gadangwe Council calls for probe into incident. And the Gadangwe Council has condemned the use of live ammunition uh, by personnel of the Ghana Navy on some Tema youth during a procession in connection with the Kledjo uh, Festival, resulting in the death of two people last Friday evening. The council in a statement called for a thorough investigation into the incident and those responsible for the deaths of the, the deaths of the two youth to be held accountable and brought to justice. According to the Ghana Armed Forces, a vehicle belonging to the Eastern Naval Command of the Ghana Navy was vandalized by a crowd participating in the festival at Tema Newtown at about 7.53 p.m. I'm sure you're familiar with the tale of the tape, uh, but I had in the studio just yesterday... We hosted Janet Amu, uh, a sister to one of the deceased, Christopher Amu. We hosted Henry, who is PRO for the Youth uh, Council. And the story they tell, and, and we're just waiting to find out what the truth is, but if you see a crowd that is moving, right, quite a, a mammoth crowd, and you, you're plowing through with a vehicle at a certain speed, you know there will be agitation. I'm not rooting for any side. But then there are, you know how sometimes, I've seen this happen, when a car is speeding like that through a crowd, and then you want to hit it a bit, yo, what is happening? And then these skirmishes happen, two people dead. That, that, is, that is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Uh, some have spoken about the fact that you can't get into a naval base. The people say they never got in there, and that it was only after the shots had been fired and some people had been affected that then there were some, but whatever the case may be, uh, Janet said yesterday that, the, the autopsy was going to take place at around 9.30 a.m. We want to find out what the results will be and how we curb this um, friction between civilians and especially the military. Uh, your take, Doc. Um, I want to believe, and uh, I know that is a fact, that demonstration is a right guaranteed under our constitution. So once people seek the necessary legal approvals, uh, they are good to go. 
if that was done and the people were on the street, all right, then they needed protection by the police. At that time, where were the police? And how did it happen that uh, the soldiers also got in and then we had this unfortunate situation on our hand? I believe that uh, institutions must be up and doing and work proper. Uh, these things call for thorough investigation, and I support the call from the Gandangwe uh, group that they need to get to the bottom of this matter. And we know those who have crossed the red line and we meet out appropriate sanction. This is uh, the best way that we can handle this situation so that we allow public opinion uh, to exist in this country, provided those who are in charge of that work within the framework of the law. Public opinion is critical and it's expressed through a number of ways. One of the means by which people express themselves in a way of public opinion is through demonstration, strike, and the rest of them. So when they do, they need the, the best protection so as to enjoy that right that exists in their constitution. Um, the other story I'll do from the Ghanaian Times newspaper, affected communities lose 1.6 billion Ghana cities in our great livelihoods. That's uh, the Food uh, and Agriculture Organization's um, assessment. And um, an estimated 1.6 billion Ghana cities in agricultural livelihoods were lost due to the Akusombo or Pong Dams as pillage that affected eight districts in the Great Accra, Eastern and Volta regions in September and October uh, last year. Now, according to the story, this represents an estimated 1.2% in gross domestic product of Ghana, a consultant at the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, of the United Nations, Stephen Frimpon, disclosed last Friday at an expert review recovery and rehabilitation planning workshop at Sogakope in uh, the Volta region. Officials of the FAO, uh, Ministry of Food and Agriculture, district directors of the Ministry of uh, Food and Agriculture, officials of NADMO and Ghana Statistical Service participated in the workshop. So this tells you what the impact has been. Yes, oh, uh, VRA and all of that and the spillage, but this is how much, 1.6 billion uh, Ghana cities. This represents an estimated 1.2% of our uh, GDP. Uh, if you have any quick reactions, Doc, I will take them before I move on to the next paper very quickly. Yeah, I think uh, this problem, which uh, we had some time ago, um, very, very unfortunate. But uh, if you were listening to experts on the ground, there are things we must get them right. One is the building of the Pualugu Dam so that it will contain any water from what? Up north. And then by the time they spill some to Akosomo, the pressure would have reduced and then the effect on Palm Dam will not be devastating and all that. Uh, we should get certain bases right. Those who build around uh, the, the water uh, uh, way and then uh, the, 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 the caution, the, the measure that we need to take in order to save the dam. Once we are able to do these things, uh, we shouldn't suffer uh, heavy losses like this when uh, there, there is a spillage. And of course, all the, the managers of the dam must also go according to the rules of the game so that at the end of the day, you don't create this situation and then create problems for society. That's all. Uh, the Daily Guide newspaper, NDC runs from a JISO by election. That's how they couch it. But of course, the party has been talking about the fact that um, owing to certain developments, they would rather root for right from the outset. Uh, they would rather plan for December rather than partake in this. Men's Gold customers uh, petition AG over Nam One uh, properties. As for this Nam One story, I'm tired of it. I'm, I'm honestly very tired of it. I feel it's almost as though there were different laws for different people in Ghana. So um, if you belong to a certain class or you have a certain, you are in a certain uh, wealth bracket, you are treated with kid gloves and all of that. Because I feel with everything, the, the circus we've had, if there were anything that he had to be in the cooler for, he had to be. Look at how we dealt with, um, what's his name again? Atuesian, for example. Until finally, we had to put him in the cooler. Woyome, 
And, you know, I mean, I feel we are not serious enough in this, in this country. And it, it saddens me looking at the number of, for how many years now we've been talking about this? Do you know how many people have suffered illnesses Sorry, and not been able to deal with it? So the little I see about it. To the have died. <laughs> I mean, we're tired of these stories. If they'll do something, they should. If they won't, they should just they stop should just talking about it altogether. Zip it, zip it, really. Zip it and stop uh, all the plenty Where talk. is he? I, I don't even don't know. know where the, where so the, let me get into the story then, since, since you are a person of interest, if I may. Um, the Coalition of Aggrieved Customers of Men's Gold has submitted a petition to the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Justice to investigate the reported sale of frozen properties of Nanapia Menza, a.k.a. Nam1, the chief executive officer of the defunct company. Uh, the petition filed yesterday raises questions about the alleged sales of uh, properties formerly owned by Nam1, which were confiscated by law enforcement agencies, including the Economic and Organized Crime Office. And what happened there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, then my credit score gets credit bureau license. Uh, that story on page nine. Let me do that, and then we get into other papers, and it's a wrap. So, my credit score limited, a Ghanaian company with a mission to promote financial inclusion through responsible borrowing, has been granted provisional credit bureau license by the Bank of Ghana. The approval marks a significant step forward for the company's mission to empower Ghanaians with access to fair and accurate credit assessments. Well, let's see how that goes. Oh, and in an entertainment, KK Fosu denies Oga targeted Samini. KK Fosu is back in the picture. Do you remember? Do you remember his... Oh, you don't know KK Fosu? I know KK Fosu. Okay, but you don't remember his songs? You were going to ask something. No, I was just, I was just wondering whether you knew... KK Fosu. Yes, I know KK. Okay. Megan, I'm uh, not that young. Do, do, do you remember? Do you remember <laughs> Suja? <laughs> because it, it had yes. Samini, Tiny, yes. and all of those. Yes. KK K Fosu. <laughs> Let's get into it. Any reactions, uh, Doc? Before we move on to other people. I think I'll look at the NDC story. Hmm. Um. I I think that the NDC should have contested the election. They know or we all know that they were not going to win at Ejiso. But for some strategic reasons, they should have been there. One, um, to be there and test the, 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 the political uh, temperature there in terms of uh, votes and how much uh, there is that they are going to get uh, as against what the MPP will get there. Uh, you want to find out if MPP votes begin to dwindle there, it gives you, whilst NDC is contesting, it gives you an idea as to the, the, the resources you can measure and then the kind of campaign you want to do to get the full effect uh, come December 7. Why am I saying this? Because you and I know uh, that in Ashanti region, NDC needs about 30% to be able to win the election. So once you gauge this move, uh, when you are contesting, it gives you an idea as to whether uh, there is a problem in there. What is likely to hit Ashanti region, if care is not taken, is apathy. So you want to find out whether people will mass up and go and vote in the by-election. If not, then it gives you an idea of what is happening. You want to see the quantum of votes that NPP will gain from this. That is when NDC is also contesting. All these things are a good mix that will help you to plan for 2020 um, for December 7. Uh, so saying that you are not going to contest, I believe that uh, they should have taken a second look at the issue and then contested. And that would have given them a sense of uh, what is ahead to plan and plan well. But it is their, having said this, I must say that it is their decision uh, to uh, stay put or be part of the process. Okay. But Ben, before we wrap up, the uh, Food and Drugs Authority has a statement on this J&J drug um, recall, assuring the public that the drug has not actually entered the market and they're you know, monitoring. Let me just read the statement briefly. The Food and Drugs Authority wishes to inform the public of the recall of the um, Benlin Pediatric Syrup, lots number 329304 by the Nigerian National Agency for Food and Drugs Administration from the Nigerian market and that the recall was necessitated by the detection of an unacceptable high level of diethylene cycle in the product. So the product is not on the market, and there are some ongoing assessment and surveillance efforts across the country so far, and it confirmed the absence of the lot in Ghana. So 
just to assure the public that this syrup is not in the country and uh, we are okay. That's All good. Right. That's good to know. Yeah. That's good to know. The Economy Times, I'll just take this headline, we'll not delve into it, but gold for oil policy may be reintroduced as CD weakens. That's according to the Bank of Ghana. Mm. And um, we'll take a look at that, I guess, in subsequent discussions. But Doc, thank you so much for joining us this morning for uh, the newspaper review. We're grateful and we wish you the best of the day. Thank you. Have a pleasant day. All right. God bless. And that's how we cap it off. Uh, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, uh, <laughs> helping yeah, us to bring you chronic disease. <laughs> this segment. They're still offering you uh, prostate free screening for free screening. if you're a man and uh, fertility screening if you're a woman. Just reach out to them at their branches across Pintex, opposite the Shell signboard. Kumasi Kronuma, we here behind the Angel Educational Complex. Takwa Dianaji State, Tema Committee 22. Techiman Hanswa and Esia Manzama. You can reach them on 0244-867. 068 or 0274 234 321. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. Let's do it right. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. All right. Sports is up next, and it was a humbling moment for Barcelona uh, yesterday. Some say without that red card for Araujo, uh, they could have done a lot more, but could they? Barcelona making it big was, men cry. It was all in <laughs> making whom cry? Big men cry. Oh, I yeah. Big Barcelona fans. Oh, no. I, I could have helped <laughs> them to cry further, but you know, it's. Uh, but I mean, Barcelona already leading by three goals to two and Mufta, scoring. Mufta will tell scor them all scoring about the first Let's goal. Go, you can tell how they felt like it was yeah. in the bag and then Charlie. Charlie. So keep watching. Mufta is, is bringing you all the details, okay? All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to AM Sports here. Yeah, I am. Muftao Nabila Abdullahi. On Tuesday, media reports from Kumasi suggested that fans of Kumasi Asante Kotoko went to the club's training ground and stopped the technical team from training the boys after they had gone about uh, 10 matches uh, with eight defeats. So the supporters say technical team members should not be allowed to take charge of the team. This is from our sister stations in Kumasi, Love FM, and they are reporting that some section of Asante Kotoko fans, led by Ashanti Regional Circles Chairman Alex Menu, went to the Adako Jachi today to stop Coach Ogum from training the team. They want Coach Ogum to step aside for another person to lead the team technically. Coach Ogum was absent from the training on Tuesday based on an intel of a potential attack he had picked up. Uh, the uh, interim management committee chairman, um, Quantum, hmm, sorry, intervened and then calm was uh, restored by speaking with the supporters. Leadership of the club called off the training after the development affected the team's training schedule. So um, that is what is coming in from Kumasi. We do not have an update yet as what has transpired, but what uh, was suggested was that there were going to be a training session at the club's, um, the team's uh, house, so that was a club house, to further deliberate on the technical direction of the team as well as how they were going to ensure that the team is back to winning ways. So uh, this is what is currently happening in Kumasi as Kumasi Asante Kotoko, um, yeah, their supporters went to the club's training ground to the, stop the technical team from training. As you, you, you saw from our sister station in Kumasi, the technical team had picked intel that um, there was going to be a likely attack on them, so they didn't go to the training grounds on Tuesday.
Now, let's hear from the club licensing manager of the Ghana Football Association, Esme Mens. He says that it's about time the football government but it's toughen its regulations to ensure that members adhere to these regulations. According to him, one of the things that is quite important for the development of football is the youth clubs. He says the club licensing authority will ensure that each and every club which is a member of the Ghana Football Association adhere to these regulations. There are so many requirements clubs must meet uh, to be able to be issued uh, licenses before they can uh, participate in, in our local uh, leagues. We can only improve. That, that, that should be the main aim of our, our department. In fact, with any department, you improve on uh, what is already there. So because whatever has been done before is not bad. We just need to improve. We just need to work on it and improve on it and be a little bit tough on certain things because when we look at uh, our training pitches and we look at uh, the youth development, which is the main aim of our football, uh, clubs don't usually pay attention to uh, our youth football development. So we'll look at that thoroughly and make sure things are done right at the, at the, at the juvenile level. Things will change gradually. It won't be uh, a one day something. No, it will be gradual. It's a process. So we'll, we'll follow through with the process and make sure things are done. Meanwhile, the director of competitions, uh, Julius Emuna, he says that hooliganism is an area his department would be fighting so hard uh, since taking over the, the, the job. According to him, one of the things that hampers the GFA's fight against hooliganism in Ghana football is the fact that there's familiarity between supporters and police officers who are often sent to march venues to provide security for marches. And he says about time they will engage the Inspector General of Police to send police officers from other districts or regions to go and provide security for marches in other areas. Every week we are going to analyze the marches and uh, plan ahead from a security perspective, the necessary deployment that needs to be done. We are even exploring the possibility through the IGP to do crisscrossing policing where police from different districts or region will police certain marches. As we all appreciate that familiarity with police officers, one of the reasons why some supporters misbehave. We are also not, I mean, uh, leaving no stone on ten in terms of uh, putting corporates before courts, as you, you really know that those incidents that happened in Kumasi, they've gone, they've gone to courts and the case is being processed and if found guilty, they are going to face the law. That is also going to send a strong warning to other hooligans in the game. It is a zero tolerance towards hooligans because they have no place in our football. Football is a, game, it's a friendly game and uh, we expect that no matter the results, we have to exhibit that Ghanaian friendship culture we all have. And so people who are hooligans, we want to send a strong warning to them that we are sorry. The Ghana Football Association is strongly against hooligans. So if you are a hooligan, uh, you can find a different place to attend, not our football venues. During the 2023 African Games last month, one of the athletes that uh, flew high Ghana's flag was Abeku Jackson in the swimming. He won two medals in this competition, a silver and a bronze. Well, that success he chalked in the competition inspired other young swimmers who want to involve, get themselves involved in swimming. My colleague, Mubarak Haruna, has more in this special feature put together by George Sports. A golden moment for Abeku Jackson. At this year's African Games, he not only defies the odds, but also he shatters a long-standing jinx, emerging as the first Ghanaian swimmer to seize a medal at this prestigious event. It's a really rushy finish to the end. What is it going to be? Look at Abeku Jackson in lane five. Lane four is going strongly as well. That's Kalafala Ali of Egypt. He's going really strongly. In the end, it's Kalafala who's going to take it. Abeku Jackson. And there it is. It's a silver medal for Ghana. 
4-2-3 and the Guardians yet again. Abeku stellar performance clinching silver and bronze in the 50 and 100 meters butterfly events not only captivated audiences but also ignited a spark of inspiration. 12-year-old Lord Mana Ashley is part of a swimming brotherhood that has been making waves in Ghana over the last few years. Their father is Sergeant Mana David. I'm very happy for Abeku Jackson and uh, he has done really well for the country, for himself, for the swimming fraternity and the family as well. We thank God for him. I know Abeku Jackson uh, from 2017. Uh, he trained here at the Birmingham Sports Complex and in fact from his demeanor you will see that Abeku Jackson is hungry for success and I'm not surprised Abeku won these medals. And uh, this will inspire the young ones coming up. It will, it will inspire them a lot. Because it, uh, they will also uh, know that when we train like Abeku Jackson, we, we will hit at the top level of swimming. We will also win medals for our country. It all boils on training, discipline, and hard work. Abeku's success extends beyond the confines of local pools, throwing a spotlight upon Ghana on a global stage. Several places, different places, different competitions, different countries. I mean, he's, he's phenomenal. People hear Abeku and they're like, hey, that boy. You see, with swimming, you need height. Even without the height, he's still doing as yeah, He's like still that. doing well, yes. He's still doing well. Yeah. So you can never tell what happens, though. But he, he made us proud of the two that he won. With Ghanaian's gaze fixed upon him, Abeku stands on the brink of his ultimate test, the Olympic Games. A daunting challenge lies ahead as he strives to secure qualification for the pinnacle of athletic achievement slated for August. For me, this is always a stepping stone. I mean, it's good to have competitions before the main Olympics. It's good to have African Games, World Championship. I recently just came back from World Championship. Before World Championship, I had a different competition. It's been back to back to back competitions and it's, it's the way forward. It's always to drop my time. It's always to get into the, my personal best, drop my time, move forward, qualify for the Olympics and make my nation proud. The, step in, the, 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 the next step for me is to go back to training see what went wrong, be it medal, two medals, three medals, there's always something, there's always room for improvement. So I'm going to go back, um, improve, work on everything I can and give my best. He has the chances to qualify. He just has to push himself a little bit more. And I believe here in Ghana, nobody, nobody during these games had a qualifier. Yeah. Qualified, nobody. Yeah. And you'll be wondering why. I mean, we don't know why, but <laughs> we are hoping that during this European uh, Championship Tour, he might bring us a qualifier. As Abeku eyes global acclaim, his trailblazing success ignites the dreams of aspiring Ghanaian swimmers, proving that with determination and passion, barriers are meant to be broken. Haruna Mubarak for Joy Sports. In the UEFA Champions League, semi-final tickets already booked for PSG and Borussia Dortmund. And it was Borussia Dortmund. They secured a 4-2 win uh, when they came up against Atletico Madrid, whilst PSG, they wall up Barcelona by four goals to one. There will be more action tonight. Uh, Bayern Munich will come up against uh, Arsenal, whilst Manchester City will be playing Real Madrid. Let's hear from the managers of uh, Bayern Munich and that of uh, Arsenal, as well as Manchester City and Real Madrid. That's your sports for now. We do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. And when you go on myjoyonline.com, in about an hour, you'll be reading a story that has to do with um, the cars ruling that will be coming in after George Fria was disqualified from contesting the GFA presidential elections last year. We have details and we'll be publishing that 
for my joy online shortly. Welcome back on the AM show. We get into our big stories. And um, we start with a talk about the PURC. That tussle with the ECG after failing to publish a load management timetable and peddling falsehoods about the cause of the erratic power supply between the period January to March 2024, including other breaches. Now, the PURC has therefore handed a hefty fine of, get this if you've not heard yet, 5.8 million Ghana cities to be paid by the board members of the ECG, including the head of the ECG, Samuel Dubik Mahama. But what does this mean for the power sector in the wake of, well, the power crisis? Uh, we delve into this issue this morning. Joining us, uh, for starters, we have Dr. Yusuf Suleiman. He's an energy strategist all the way in Oman, and he joins the conversation. But before we do... Before we get to him, uh, let me find out whether we have Kofi J, Isaac Kofi J, our uh, in-house data analyst. Uh, Kofi, can you hear me? Are you with me, uh, Kofi J? All right, so we'll try to get in uh, Isaac Kofi J. There's quite a lot he has to walk us through uh, just to set the tone for the conversation in respect of where we are, how we got here, and what has been happening in uh, between. We'll get into that conversation in terms of the PURC and its engagements with the ECG up until now, what has happened in between and what we can expect moving forward on the back of the regulator, the PURC, taking these drastic measures. Uh, Kofi Ajay, are you with me? Okay. Yes, I'm with you, Ben. Great, Thank great. You, it's really good to have you. Uh, you're looking spick and span this morning. Thank you for joining the conversation. Uh, walk us through right, thank you. the road to getting here. How did we get here and what has been happening between the PURC and the ECG? Just walk us through that. So first, uh, per what the PURC put out yesterday, according to their analysis of data provided by the ECG, the ECG has not only uh, disobeyed PRC's orders, but they've also breached an IMF structural benchmark, and you have on your screens about four of the orders that ECG did not comply with. Most of them, uh, or some of them, were partially complied with, and PRC did not take it lightly at all. Uh, they indicated last month that as a result of ECG's inability to comply with all the orders, uh, they were going to place sanctions, and yesterday we saw the sanctions that have been placed. But how did this whole thing happen and how did we get here as a country? In fact, I might say that, but, but for the IMF program, it would have been very, very difficult for us to get uh, into data, like, you know, having even to see ECG's monthly inflows or revenue, not to even talk about how much they, they are able to raise in a quarter. It was somewhat difficult even getting their annual, um, you know, a bank statement and then also financial statement. But now we can have access to such data and that's the importance of an IMF program it brings transparency so per what the PRC put out yesterday um, according to them uh, ECG was supposed to comply with one order uh, which already the, the ECG has indicated to the PRC that they had 61 bank account Ben. and the last time we checked there are about 23 commercial banks in Ghana uh, so I cannot understand how ECG, well, it's possible anyway, but it's, it's mind-boggling how ECG is able to have 61 bank accounts. What, what, does, that, what does that suggest? What does that suggest? That it has multiple uh, accounts within certain banks? Absolutely. It could, it, that, that's just up in fact, because you have six, 23 banks, commercial banks, and if you have 61 bank accounts, it means that there are seven banks that ECG has more than one account with. Now... There's a new structural benchmark that we have to meet as a country under the IMF program, and it's stated in the Article 4 review uh, that by the end of, uh, or somewhere between July and September 2023, uh, um, ECG was supposed to consolidate all of these multiple accounts into a single account. 
so that we can have a quarterly review of this account and perform analysis on them. But uh, the deadline that the, is in the IMF program or in the Article 4 is the uh, end of February 2024. And we are still, we are in April, and uh, according to what we are getting from the PRC, ECG has not uh, complied with this. And, and, and this means that um, the IMF structural benchmark that is supposed to be met under the Article 4 review has not been able to, uh, ECG has not complied. There's also one bit where ECG was supposed to pay, uh, was supposed to, you know, submit um, a look shedding uh, timetable to the PRC, uh, which they failed to do that. And, and we know the fine that has been placed, about 5.9 million Ghana cities, placed not on ECG as a company, uh, but on its board members. There were also, you know, other fines, about 36,000 Ghana cities as a result of ECG's uh, Hello, Isaac. Okay, I believe there are some challenges with the connection of Isaac Kofia J, and we'll try to uh, work that out and get him back. Uh, do I hear you now, Kofi? Kofi, can you hear me? Okay, we'll try to work the co connection of Isaac Kofia J. Uh, he was walking us through the nitty gritty, the details there. And interesting because, of course, and I was just going to pose the next question. It, it, it stands to reason that as the ECG has not been able to comply with this end, it's an Article 4 uh, instrument or arrangement as far as the IMF is concerned. It's one of those requirements. So once we are not meeting the requirements on the back of what the ECG is doing, it creates problems generally, right? So that is one. And then the low shedding timetable that uh, the ECG had been directed by the regulator, the PRC, to be delivering, it had not delivered on some uh, counts. So Isaac was walking us through that first um, slide about the payment of tariff revenue as prescribed by the Cash Waterfall uh, Mechanism Committee. That is also uh, in the fray. He's, he's already spoken about the first two load shedding and then uh, the Article 4 arrangement, which the ECG had to comply with by end of February, where in April that has still not been complied with. 61 uh, accounts uh, thereabouts when they had to have one consolidated account so that the money coming in could be monitored, and then the cash waterfall mechanism uh, and its regulations could be followed. But the ECG hasn't done that, which has led uh, to this slapping of the board members, including the head of the ECG, with the 5.8 million uh, Ghana cities that they have to cough up. Uh, do we have Kofi back? Okay, so I'll, I'll proceed from there. So you look at the orders and the remarks, you'd realize that the first one has to do with uh, a payment of tariff revenue as prescribed by the Cash Waterfall Mechanism Committee. Kofi, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. All right, Let, let's go back. We lost you for about 30 seconds. So let's go back to the point you were making. Right, so I was talking about the fine that has been placed on um, board members of the ECG. Now, PRC was contemplating as to whether they should place this fine on ECG as a company. But when they analyze ECG's um, you know, revenue function, they realize if they place the fine of almost 6 million Ghana cities, that will be uh, a burden on, on ECG because already they are struggling to meet uh, the needed requirements under the cash waterfall mechanism. So they found it prudent to now place the uh, fine of almost 6 million Ghana cities on board members. So if you were a board member um, up until March 18, 2024, uh, you are included in this, uh, you know, function. You are supposed to be part of those who will be paying that 5.9 million Ghana cities. Now, beyond the fines, uh, there were other interesting findings on the cash waterfall mechanism, just like you were, you were talking about. I mean, the PLC, based on their matrix, was expecting uh, about 98% of ECG's collection. Now, if we do the math, it means PRC was expecting somewhere around 8.9 billion Ghana cities uh, from the ECG in terms of collection based on the, their sales or their declared sales. But they did some sort of analysis and they realized that it cannot be met, so 7 billion was a target. And out of this 7 billion, uh, ECG was able to collect 4.9 million billion out of it. So you could see the shortfall of some 2.1 billion Ghana cities. Now, whenever there's a shortfall in the collection under the cash waterfall mechanism, 
the entity that must come in to, um, how do you call it, help to close the gap uh, is the finance ministry. Now, if you read or peruse what the PRC put out somewhere March or uh, February 2024, you realize that under the cash waterfall mechanism, the finance ministry has not been complying uh, with its you know, gap closing mandate since August 2023. They are supposed to pay some 200 million Ghana cities to, uh, you know, the cash waterfall mechanism and the finance ministry has not done that. So the problem goes beyond just ECG. There are other stakeholders that, um, you know, PRC must also take a look at them, like Greco, for instance. And another player like the finance ministry under the cash waterfall mechanism where they are supposed to do the top up. Now, yesterday we got an interesting... The, the, the same, um, the know, same finance ministry. In terms of... The same finance ministry that supposedly allowed the ECG to use part of the money that should have been used in the cash waterfall mechanism to purchase fuel, right? Absolutely. According to ECG's MD, um, they actually anticipated that they were going to have issues with fuel supply. So uh, they had to do some sort of pre-financing. They reached out to the finance ministry if they could go ahead. But the finance ministry said, oh, yeah, you can go ahead. We'll reimburse you later. Uh, but according to the PRC, since March 2023, the, uh, you know, August 2023, the finance ministry uh, has not done its part of the bargain under the cash waterfall mechanism. Mm. And you could sense that since that time, the finance ministry is supposed to give PRC some sort of, um, um, you know, financial obligation that they've not done that. So the problem goes beyond just ECG. Mm. As Gridco is involved, the finance ministry must be dragged into this conversation because they play an important role in the cash waterfall mechanism. The whole thing has to do with money. And just like we've always been saying, why is ECG in this pragma? It's because ECG does most of their production in dollars. But the revenue they collect is in CDs. And so when it reaches the time for them to pay their key stakeholders, you see forex losses. So the amount of money that ECG is supposed to pay actual debt they end up using those monies to pay for its losses. And that's why the finance ministry is important and will have to come in uh, under this, uh, you know, in, in this instance to come and close the gap for us to have reliable... In, in other words, if in other words, because at, of the depreciation of our currency, the ECG yes. is always going to be facing these problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if you look at the current strategy we are using to curb our energy generation, you know, gap, I feel that we'll have more of these problems going forward. Just this week, we've seen the president, um, I don't know how they call it, but rebranding of the American plant, which is right. also an IPP. All of these are providing thermal energy, which is about 65, more than 65% of our reliable and dependable capacity at the moment. All of them depend on fuel. So if you keep adding, or if you keep you know, trying to go towards um, IPPs or thermal energy generation, and uh, you are not really looking at the hydro, which is the Akosombo and Bui, then it tells you that going forward will have some of these problems because one, you will need money to buy fuel, and this fuel is not sold in cities, they are sold in dollars. You don't print dollars in Ghana. So anytime that we have problems with our, our currency, we'll have to cough up more cities to be able to pay. For instance, in 2024, the Energy Commission estimated that we will need about $1.4 billion to buy fuel to feed our power plants in order to, you know, generate power. And we know the current situation now we are in. We are currently uh, in negotiation with some of our even creditors for us to get the needed financing assurance to get $360 million under the IMF program. Our, extra, our reserves are dwindling. Currently, we are talking about 1.7 months of import cover. So we don't have the forest to do some of these things, but we keep adding up. And we are neglecting the hydro that was, um, you know, formerly very reliable. We've not really added up. Uh, Bui is there, but Bui, if you read the PRC's, um, you know, account on Bui, you will see the kind of situation Bui is in at the moment. Why are we having all of these problems when we can sort of, you know, have a, a mix and not really depend on just thermal energy like we are going currently because we will need a lot of dollars to power these plants? Mm. And these are questions to be asked. Even you may consider what could have come to the rescue as well, the Pualugu 
multi-purpose dam. If it were in place, it could have you know, helped uh, bridge the gap. Anything else you'd like to add, uh, Kofi, before we move on to our other guests? Or is that the summary for you so far? Well, the last thing probably will have to do with some sort of, you know, um, happiness going on in the cash waterfall mechanism is a waterfall mechanism. So all the energy sector players must come here to drink. Drinking means they must fall on this uh, mechanism to get um, their payment. Now, it looks as if ECG is treating some of the um, sector players with priority and, uh, and others with some sort of disdain. Because they are categorized into two, category A and B. Now, category A are the IPPs who basically are providing thermal energy, about 65% of our capacity. Almost all of them relying on fuel, and that's where the problem is coming from. And ECG is spending majority or significant portions of whatever they generate to sort these IPPs. Now, when it comes to the category B, which has to do with the state-owned enterprises, most of them, some of the hydro companies like Akosombu and Bui, ECG has not really been forthcoming in terms of some of the payment they have to make to them. And if you look at the report we had yesterday from the PRC, about more than 446 million Ghana cities has been deducted from ECG's revenue between the period and our review, and it's supposed to be paid to the category B power you know, players. And since August 2023, ECG has not complied with this. So you ask yourself, why is ECG treating the category A IPPs or um, sector players with some sort of priority? And those that are state-owned enterprises are not being treated the way they are supposed to be treated. The only excuse they give is that when it comes to the category B, it is the finance ministry that's supposed to come in to do some of this um, financing. But they've also not been forthcoming since August 2023. And so the issue now goes beyond just ECG and Gridco. The finance ministry must come in to answer some of these questions, Ben. Isaac Kofi AJ, uh, always uh, breaking it down to bite-sized bits so that everyone can understand. We're very grateful. Thank you so much uh, for joining the conversation. That is Isaac Kofi AJ. He is a data analyst, uh, our own in-house statistician, uh, if you like. But let me now bring in uh, from the other end of town, Dr. Yusuf Suleiman. He's an energy strategist all the way in Oman. Uh, Dr. Suleiman, good, good morning to you, sir. Yeah, good morning to you, uh, Benjamin, and uh, thank you for having me. Nice to see you again. Uh, good to see you. And, and though I'm saying morning, I don't know, what time is it in Oman currently? Yeah, so we are four, four hours ahead. We are almost heading to midday. Okay. Yeah, so it's, right. it's, it's, it's in the afternoon, almost in the afternoon. So, but that's fine. It's, it's still morning. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is no laughing matter, but let's start from how we got here. At least we, we see from... August last year and the requirements and, and the finance ministry and their um, commitments and the ECG. Now, the ECG has done very well under Samuel Dubik Mahama in terms of fund collection, in terms of trying to get from people, especially those stealing power and all of that, ensuring that a lot of it comes into the pool. But where they have not fared so well is in dealing with a cash waterfall mechanism. And now, especially since the power outages started, putting out a load shedding timetable. But for you, how did we get here? Briefly on that. Yeah, so um, how did we get here? Um, it's, it's very interesting. I think we've talked about this uh, a couple of times, um, why we are in this situation. Um, though, if you look at the situation, we've almost everybody knew, or every pundit who monitors the sector knew that, I mean, we have a generation shortfall. But generation shortfall is not directly coming from the generator that they are not, uh, they have the ability to generate, but they cannot generate. It's just that they don't have the push in terms of the financial reward with that. So if you look at the three, three, these three value chains that we have, they are so intricately linked, I mean, seamlessly, that then if there is an inherent inefficiency in one of them, the cascading impact on the others will die. And I always mention that ECG is the lifeline. ECG is the artery. If ECG is not able to generate the required revenue to be able to feed the other two, we're going to have problems. And that's what, that's what we have here. And I agree with you. I have several on several platforms, you know, commended the current leadership of ECG, especially the MD, for his proactiveness and uh, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, activism and in, in, in this ability to be able to get a lot of money, 
you know, from uh, customers. And then the fact that they are also going cashless, that has been excellent, uh, you know. So I've commended them for that. Until the, this recent times, this development, and I always throw a caution to them that, look, all the gains that you are making, if they things that are coming up, if you don't have control or you don't just get yourself off them, it's going to negate all the beautiful things that you've gotten. And that's what is coming. Um, coming back to that issue, why I'm saying that they may end up negating all the successes that they have chopped. Um, uh, Benjamin, I cannot, in my wildest imagination, uh, apprehend or appreciate the inertia with respect to each, each different. Why they cannot comply with this basic fundamental requirement? With almost everybody saying that these are the issues on board and they cannot comply. And I agree with your, I mean, uh, your, sense, uh, your, your data analyst. In fact, he's, he's also an expert. I, I really appreciate what, what, what he put out there. It has to go beyond, I always say it has to go beyond ECG. Because ECG for me, as an entity independently cannot say they will not do load management. They cannot do that. ECG is under somebody. So I always say that once we call for that, we have to go beyond ECG. And the back stop with the, fire, uh, with the energy ministry. I have to make it very blunt. Because if today the energy minister categorically tells ECG that Ghanaians really require load, uh, load management, do that, they cannot stop. They cannot stop. They cannot, uh, you know, they, they have to do that. And so if you look at um, all the fines and then whatever that PRC, you know, has placed on ECG, they were all avoidable. Number one, the very main one, the cash water form, mechanic, that one is not a fine. It is just a payment that was supposed to be done. The money has been declared collected. I mean, uh, the, the leaders of the cash water form mechanism, they had a committee. They, all, they have a formula that they're supposed to distribute this money. Now, this formula is supposed to be adhered to. As to why ECG has not been able to adhere to that, nobody can understand this. And this, it beats everybody's imagination. And so, um, and, if, and if you look at the other ones, um, the 36,000 Ghana series as a result of data, basic fundamental data that you're supposed to provide, um, um, you, you find it difficult to do that. And even those ones, you could come to the regulator and then negotiate, understand with the regulator, sit with the regulator and tell the regulator that one, two, three, these are the reasons why I cannot comply or I'm finding it difficult or, or it's taking me this longer time to, to you know to comply. But we are not seeing that. And why mm. and we are not seeing that not only that, we are seeing kind of statements that are coming from ECG that shows a kind of impunity, which is so unfortunate. Right. It, you know, and I'm saying and I'm saying impunity uh, because if you tell me you, you are not going to you don't have a problem. And even as you speak now, Benjamin, we have dumb dumb so or erratic power supply. What is happening? So, um, and if you look at that 5.8 or almost 6 million, it's as a result of um, a failure to adhere to this notion. It was simple. Just adhere to that, come up with a timetable, and how the people are going to um, plan their own lives, and you simply cannot do that. And one, main, one other thing that I'll, 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 I'll add in my introductory statement before I land. See, having a low shedding timetable or low management timetable is not going to solve them so. We know that. Mm. Now, a basic risk assessment, those who have done risk assessment, whether you are in the operational field, finance field, or whatever, if you have a top event or a fallout, okay. it means that your, your, your mitigation, they have failed. All right. Now, you need to look at what you call recoverable mitigations. What the recoverable mitigations or reactive mitigations will do, they will minimize the consequences of the fallout. Here, the, the fallout is done so. We have to minimize the consequences on the, the impacted Populist. And how do you minimize the consequences? Load management can minimize the consequences. You saw what happened with the hospitals. If right. hospitals had actually gotten this kind of load shedding or load management, some of these things that happened would, would, have, been, would have happened. So I, I really find it very difficult to appreciate uh, why ECG cannot do that. And to right. top it all, I think I, I love the fact that I mean, PRC, they are taking ECG to cleaners in this situation. I think they have to. They have to uh, stay on, stay the call, and other agencies have to, you know, for, you know, uh, I mean, copy them or look look at what they are doing and do and do similar. I think it will help in building our corporate governance. Interesting thoughts. The PRC must stay the course and ensure that those in the chain actually comply with its directives, so everyone can have, you know, 
uh, a piece of the pie, and we as consumers can also uh, benefit from that. But let me also bring into the conversation Nana Mwesi. He's Executive Director, Institute of Energy Security. Good morning, sir. To your viewers. Right. Um, for you, you've been speaking about this issue, and now it has come, things have come to a head. Uh, it's a straight fight, if you like, between the PURC, the regulator, and the ECG. But did we even have to get to this point? And if not, um, what can be done now that the, the PURC is biting hard at the ECG? Sanctions to individual board members uh, to be split among them, including the ECG boss, and uh, directives as far as bank accounts, the cash waterfall mechanism is concerned. Your take? Uh, uh, firstly, what I would say uh, is that this is an avoidable uh, development. Um, yet we, we, we knew it would come to this. Um, mm. We spoke to you some time ago that we don't see the ECG issuing the timetable. Uh, I'm using that as an instance. Um, issuing the timetable as directed by the PRC, uh, because if you have a whole minister come to say, if Nanamwesi and Kingsley needs a timetable, they should go uh, and generate one themselves. If the PRC needs one, they should go and put out one themselves. Then it means that they have the backing of the minister uh, not to uh, issue the directive or follow the directive of the regulator. Uh, in fact, uh, today, uh, it is confirmed that um, there is a total breakdown in governance and accountability within uh, ECG, as well as lack of transparency in communicating uh, with consumers. And at this moment, I think that you highlight the importance uh, of regulatory oversight to ensure that utilities comply with directives and provide accurate information to the public. Uh, this is what the PRC uh, it's set up to do. And so for them cracking the whip at this point, uh, we support them uh, to the hills. Um, and it's also good to hear that it is not the ECG that has been uh, penalized directly, but then the management and the board of the entity, because uh, they sit there in a, a what lawyers may call fiduciary position and expected to do what is right uh, for, for, for us. But then, so they, they must bear that very uh, brunt, that is their recalcitrant um, behavior that has brought them this far. However, we also admit that uh, there might be some remedies available to the board and management. Uh, they could appeal the fine through legal channels. Uh, they can go ahead and rather start implementing corrective measures to address the issues uh, raised by the PRC, maybe it could save them somehow, and they can go ahead and start now improving communication uh, and compliance uh, between uh, the consumers and they themselves. Now, you, you, you would see that the, the PRC is cracking the whip, and, and you say that it's on the back of the recalcitrance of the ECG. That in itself uh, paints a certain picture. But do you feel the fine is too hefty. Mind you, the PRC has said that if, if it actually imposes that fine on the ECG as a company, then it is we, the taxpayers or the, the, the consumers, who will end up paying for it. And it makes sense. But 5.8 million Ghana cities spread among about eight or nine people. That's a hefty sum. Is it not too hefty? Well, uh, it is for the board. Uh, 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 and management to decide <laughs> because they brought this on themselves. If they feel it's too uh, hefty, uh, like I said, uh, they can appeal. And uh, maybe there may be some other uh, remedies they can resort to. We, will, we, we don't need to waste our time and defend um, uh, ECG at this moment. No, not at all. In fact, we expect PRC to exact the fines or the penalty. Uh, so that they can enforce compliance measures. Uh, if they fail to do that, consumers like you and I can escalate uh, our concerns through um, advocacy groups where we can also resort to the Consumer Protection Agency or legal avenues. Consumers can do that. And uh, this is the test case for the PRC to see that whether uh, 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 
as an entity that can be trusted in making good their word. Uh, two quick questions to you, Nanamwesi. One has to do with the fact that, and I believe um, Yusuf Suleimana also brought that up, in terms of spreading this across. It's not just the ECG. Maybe Gridco, for now, maybe the darling boy of the, EC, uh, the PURC, but it has its own challenges as well. Should this spread across in terms of ensuring that they are all sticking strictly to what the, the, the directives are? from the PURC. And what do you see to be the role of the finance ministry in all of this mess? So one, should it go beyond, well beyond the ECG? The PURC is not just regulating the ECG. And secondly, what do you see to be the role of the finance ministry in this entire mess? Kim, with respect to the final uh, first question, I think we, we've made that call a long time ago to the PURC to look beyond uh, the ECG and uh, look upstream, um, investigate uh, Greco, uh, because the, the silence of Greco was so loud until um, just recently. They call them as investigated. Even the PRA uh, must be investigated as well relative to the power being exported. Uh, they must audit that very system and uh, also audit the Greco system. Um, and so it's a good call to look beyond the uh, the ECG. As to the role of the finance ministry, uh, you remember, Ken, at the point uh, when the PRC, um, you know, was uh, asking the ECG to account uh, for the cash waterfall system payment for January and February, there was the mention of the Ministry of Finance um, in ECG's communique as to the fact that the finance ministry directed them to do some payment. If this were well gotten to, then it makes sense also for the finance ministry to uh, uh, speak to some of these issues. But then we also expect them to make an intervention, particularly with the uh, with, uh, acquisition of fuel for the power plant. ECG may not be in a position to have that money to cough about $48 million a month in buying fuel at this moment. The, the, the energy ministry must connect with the finance ministry to find alternative ways of raising money so we can have uh, liquidity to address the fuel supply challenges and also to address the uh, plant maintenance uh, challenges of the respective generating stations. Now, now we see a uh, hold for me. Let me also bring in uh, Dr. Ishmael. Ajekum Hine, Commissioner of the PURC. Uh, Doc, good morning. Good morning, um, Mr. Ajekum uh, Doc, I can hear you, but only faintly. If you could speak up just um, a little for me, I'd be grateful. I'm saying that good morning, but I'm Mr. Ajekum I'm not the doc, Dr. Ajekum Oh, I don't, know, I don't know what is happening, why I can't, I can barely hear. Um, Hello? Yes, yes, I think it's better. You were saying you were not the commissioner. No, I'm not Dr. Ajekumihine. I'm Mr. Ajekumihine. Right. Okay. Right. Mr. Ishmael Ajekumihine, uh, Commissioner PURC. Maybe you're going to have a, a doctoral degree soon, so <laughs> maybe I'm yeah, looking yeah, into yeah. a crystal ball. But yeah. in terms of the PURC and getting here, you are now beginning to crack the whip, but there are those who also say since last year things have been happening uh, that may be required a lot more urgent attention Yes, you're doing it now, but some say it is a little too late. How do you react to that? I don't know what they mean by a little too late. But in terms of, in terms of in ensuring that the right things, I mean, since last year, the cash waterfall mechanism has been, there have been breaches, especially culminating in this year, the start of the year till February. Um, the finance ministry's actions in there, in terms of payments to independent power producers, categories A and B, especially the category B, with the finance ministry had been footing. I mean, there have been problems, even with shedding loads and all of that. Um, you looked on for a while. Is, is it that back then it wasn't as urgent as it is now? I'm not too sure what you mean by we looking on. You just need to check uh, everything that the PRC, PRC has done um, ever since this commission came to office. Um, um, there are a lot of correspondence and a lot of 
uh, directives that we give to the utilities that you don't get to hear about. Okay. Uh, so when you hear these things out, then it probably means that things have got into the stream. But please check. Check all the evaluations of the energy sector players and evaluate the critical role that the PRC has, has played. You can talk to the IMF, talk to everyone. Uh, I think we we do a lot of things that you don't get to hear in the news. So, uh, well, well, if we don't get to hear it, that, that, that is then problematic. But then you're saying that the PRC is not culpable in this. You've done everything you should have done. Uh, in that case, why has it taken so long to get the ECG to stick to the script and do what it has to do? I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure you, we're talking here about any culpability, but the, the bottom line is that the PRC is a state-owned state, state owned public utility. PRC doesn't have the powers to fire or sack anybody. PRC is also almost a quasi-government entity that if we were to even take any legal action, it's going to be the state versus the state. So those are some of the constraints that the PRC operates within. Uh, PRC can't fire anybody in the utility. It doesn't have the right to do that. So it's not as if PRC has been sitting down not doing anything. You can No, uh, I haven't mentioned firing or anything. No, no, no but I basically... Mean, you know the point, so you see, can't You, you know, can't let me, let me, fire, let me but... finally, you see, we keep warning. And again, you, you saw how difficult it was for the PRC to even figure out how best to sanction the utilities because, you know, every cost of the utility indirectly finds its way back into the tariff. Mm. So, I mean, if you go out issuing penalties and things like that, they can pay all right, but if they are filing their tariffs and they find a way of disguising that payment, it will be difficult. So ultimately, the consumers that PRC is trying to protect will end up paying for this fine. So it's a very tricky thing, and once you are not in the position to really enforce some order you you can't do much about it apart from making sure that you keep them on their toes you insist that they should maintain some reporting requirements consistently and you analyze the data and be able to know whether indeed they are complying with rules and regulations that they are supposed to operate by now some would say that in in all of this discourse the the ECG has been pretty recalcitrant, the words of some of my other guests this morning, intransigent. Um, what, do you feel the latest actions, for example, the fine, not on ECG as an entity, but on the board, will curb some of this, so to speak, intransigence and bring the ECG back to compliance? Okay, so I didn't use those words. So if that's what your panelists are saying, I, I'm, I'm not commenting on whether they did transigent or unruly. What we are hoping and we believe that once this is an order based on law, we are expecting that the utility or ECG would comply. If they don't, I believe the legal department will advise the commission appropriately. But at least some signals in sense that uh, you need to do what the law actually, uh, requires you to do. If you don't do that, the regulator would would fall on whatever tools it has within its arsenal to ensure that it do the right thing. A sum of 5.8 million on the board members, I mean, that is pretty hefty. I'm just picking my calculator and um, doing some quick mathematics divided by, there are nine of them affected, right? Eight board members and, and the boss of the ECG, am I correct? Yeah. Okay. So let's divide by nine. That, is, that, that would mean, uh, unless the permutations are different, that each one would have to cough up 644,404 uh, Ghana CDs and 444 pesos. That's a lot of money in this economy. Uh, some would ask, isn't this too hefty? Okay, so if you read the order that the commission issued, the basis of the computations are all in there. So it wasn't like off the cap. So whether or not uh, the quantum and the magnitude will lead them to, to react and respond to the order. If, if they feel that their money is too much 
and they wouldn't be able to pay. I believe we are waiting for their response and basis for which they say they wouldn't be able to pay. Mind you, if you read the order uh, uh, closely, the money is not even coming directly to PURC. There is a fund that has been created uh, for to help uh, manage the procurement of fuel. That's where the PURC is asking the fine to be paid into. And that, that fund, PRC, is not even a signatory to that account. So the order has been issued. They have some time to respond to it. Let's see how it pans out. Uh, we have given the order and we expect compliance. So uh, let's see how it goes. But in the middle of all this is a sticking point. That sticking point is the finance ministry. Because when it comes to, for example, the Cash Water Form Mechanism Committee, and fulfilling the requirements that the ECG was simply supposed to fulfill. Have a consolidated account, we can monitor what is coming in and make the necessary disbursements. Category E uh, power producers are getting pretty much of a fair share, but for the category B uh, you know, contributors, not much is going there and some people are wondering why that is. But we've also been told that the finance ministry has been standing in the gap as far as the category B players are concerned. But since August last year, it's been problematic. What is the approach of the PRC in resolving that? We, unfortunately, we don't have control over what happens at the Ministry of Finance. And the Ministry of Finance only comes in because the sector itself is not able to recover the, the, the full cost of doing business. And the real problem is ECG's collecting. You see, if ECG is able to, you know, the PRC, when they give a tariff, the regulatory benchmark for collection is 98% of all its electricity billed and sold. Okay, if you do anything below that, it means there will be revenue shortfall. We are talking about money for fuel. The tariff you and I pay when we buy electricity includes the cost of fuel. So it's not as if nobody has budgeted for fuel and we are, we are looking at the Ministry of Finance to provide. The, the real problem is that the collection rates are low. And if you, you are not able to collect, you don't have money to pay everybody in the value chain. So the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Finance was only playing a stopgap measure saying that because the sector is not able to raise all the revenues it needs to operate, you come in to plug in the gap. And that's the role that the Minister of Finance is playing. When the revised cash waterfall mechanism was, was, was developed, all that it said was that, okay, account to every money that is collected. Let's see how we distribute the money fairly. Any shortfall, according to the ESRP, the Energy Sector Recovery Program, the, Energy, the Minister of Finance was going to find the money to, to fill the gap. So the ministry is only being asked to do what they are doing because there's the recognition that the, the, the cost, that the money that are required to run the sector, we are not able to collect all of that. So that's the problem. But the PRC doesn't have any, any, any control. We can't, they can't tell the Minister of Finance. And the Minister of Finance knows the shortfalls are supposed to be made known to the Minister of Finance, and they are supposed to find the money to pay. And sometimes when they pay the money, we don't even have records of the payment from the Minister of Finance. So I don't think the PRC can do much, except that the Ministry of Finance itself is also required to do that under the Energy Sector Recovery Program, which is why the IMF is holding the country very closely to that. They should make sure that they do everything that has been said in the Energy Sector Recovery Program. But it's beyond PRC. PRC doesn't can't do anything be, uh, to, to uh, compel the Ministry of Finance to find the money to pay the shortfall. No, no, I, I, I totally appreciate that. I was just wondering how uh, you could possibly deal with the situation, especially when the ECG is, you know, it, it, it deals in dollars in terms of procurements and others, but then it is paid by ordinary Ghanaians in cities, and then you would always okay. have depreciation and So, so let me, let me, that, that, let me correct just... another. I don't know. Who am I talking to, please? This is Benjamin, Benjamin Akaka. Okay. Ah, Ben, okay. So, Benjamin, you see, that's another thing that I believe the communication department of the PRC will have to explain this for everybody to understand. You know, when we do quarterly adjustments, we are just basically adjusting for two things. We are adjusting for 
currency depreciation, inflation, and sometimes we look at the generation mix. Whether or not we have more hydro than thermal uh, as projected in the previous quarter. Okay, that's what PRS has been doing very consistently. Sometimes people are telling us that, oh, in fact, the ECG managing director is on record to have said several times that they don't need tariff increase. It, it, it tells you clearly that he probably doesn't understand. And then he turns around to say that he needs to pay for exchange rate under recovery. Check the quarterly adjustment that the PRS has been doing. They've been adjusting for currency depreciation. So that if we were to collect all the money, sometimes if the tariffs are dropped, it's not because the PRS is oblivious of the currency, but it's possible that the, the, we have more hydro coming into the regulated market, in which case if more hydro than thermal is going to be delivered within that quarter, then okay. it compensates for some of these shortfalls. Right. So, yes, we, we are fully aware that the, we pay in pesos, but that's the whole essence of the quarterly adjustment that the PRL did uh, that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ejekumahine, uh, for joining the conversation. We are very grateful for your time. That is the Commissioner of the PURC. I'll come to Yusuf uh, Suleimana, and then uh, I'll also have the final word from Nanai Mwesi before we move on. But let me quickly acknowledge as well, uh, tying into the conversation on LPG, uh, the CEO Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors um, joining the conversation, Dr. Patrick Ofori. Doc, good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank, thank you so much for having joined the conversation. Please let me just uh, wrap on this belt and then uh, I'll quickly uh, get to you. Uh, Yusuf, you. are you still on the line with us? Are you still with us? Yes, I'm here, uh, Ben. Okay, so final comments on, on this bit. We've heard from the PURC, uh, the stance of the ECG is clear. Moving forward, what, what are your expectations? How do we tame this energy problem and ensure that we are doing the best across the board for the power sector, for the players, uh, for the producers, and for the consumers? Yeah, so um, we just have to be uh, phenomenally efficient in what we are doing and what we have control over. Um, apart from the inefficiency that we are struggling to just scrape or to, uh, you know, to reduce drastically or to the barest minimum, I mean, those we can have control over, in this case, I mean, uh, whatever money is that are collected, um, the formula that is there for it to be distributed, let's stick to that. It is highly tempting. If you don't stick to that, the money will find its way somewhere else. And I particularly noticed something very worrying. Um, the reason, uh, I mean, and that points to the fact that those who could not be paid, um, you notice that this, uh, the TRC commissioner, what he mentioned, and he's right. If you look at the aggregate of factors that, that could potentially cause a tariff to come down or go up. You know, this exchange rate and then the generation mix, you know, uh, uh, plays a major role. And then we have huge potential in hydro and we need to build that. And if you look at this cash waterfall mechanism, those who were denied, you know, payment, were those, the SOEs that are under government, they have zero payment. And that's actually where this 466 million is supposed to have come from. So yes, it is not, I mean, complying to this cash water mechanism is a need base. It is something that, uh, that, that we can't do anything about. I mean, we, it's something that we can't play around. Um, if we play around, we do that to the detriment of our own power stability. And then lastly, the what I would mention is that I think um, with PRC and then the way they have been able to activate a lot of regulatory requirements, you know, to take another government parasitals on in this regard, I just find that highly commendable. And if all our SOEs um, 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 or our, those who have this oversight resp responsibility um, with agencies beneath them, they are also to reactivate. And I can tell you, uh, uh, ben, uh, ben, we do have them. We have a lot of allies that can take, uh, that regulatory agencies can reactivate. But the simple, the simple problem is that we have people who have grown very powerful beyond this regulatory message or beyond this uh, allies. And that has been the problem. So. Yes, I think the steps that TRC they have taken is an excellent one. We have to commend them. And then we have to urge, you know, other agencies to, to follow suit, to do that. And if we do that, this object or this phenomenal inefficiency we have within our issue is, I mean, there will be the thing of the past. And then I think we'll be heading to the dream line. And the dream line is 
is for where I call the dream line is when our structures begin to work, when individuals cannot go beyond this, this structure, or when they cannot go against the very dictates of these structures. And then um, the interesting thing I find about this also is the fact that um, this money that is charged on, I mean, the, 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 they're supposed to, it was supposed to have been easy to pay that. Um, so what is also suggesting is that if you are a head of an SOE, I mean, mo most of the time when we are, the heads of SOE, they just feel that they can do anything, and then at the end of the day, government absorb that, or they absorb, I mean, they absorb from anything. It does mean that if you are the head of SOE, and you, by, by your own actions and inactions, some more practice, I mean, some more practices or some infractions have been right, right, and that's what, what and that's what this speaks on, and this speak, speaks to. And I think it's commendable. We just urge that I mean, TLC should be encouraged to stay the course, and if they stay the course, I think it will help us improve uh, you know, a lot of weaknesses within our structure, yeah, within All right. our structures. And I think that has been one of the main of uh, this problem that we have. Uh, been. Dr. Suleiman, thank you very much for joining. Uh, the, the conversation. Nanamwesi, if you're still with us, your final words, and then we can, we can continue from here. Nanamwesi, your final words? All right, it appears we don't have Nanamwesi. Let me bring in Dr. Ofori uh, very quickly on uh, this beat. Uh, even before we get to the bit about uh, the, the LPG, among others, I, I'd just like to find out from you, what is your take on this energy sector uh, conundrum that we're facing? The standoff between the PURC, the ECG. Some say uh, the PRC should be delving, hitting harder, even on others like the Gridco and uh, the VRA. What's your take before we get into the substantive issue? I think it's critical that the regulator needs to step up. And then uh, from what we all know, we all fought hard in bringing the uh, cash waterfall mechanism. And whoever is non-compliant needs to be dealt with. But that, uh, that is notwithstanding the issue that we need to face as a country is the exchange rate factor that is being used. And currently, the difference between what is happening in the power sector is that they are lucky that they get the government to somehow step in sometimes to bail out. Unlike the private, the downstream sector, which is also involved in a similar situation, this one, it hits directly the individuals who are funding, that, especially the BDCs and those who are importing the product in. That is where we normally would want, uh, as a country, we need to take a key decision as to how we generate power and our sources of fuel within the country. We need to be smart, and then also above all, we need to also be honest to ourselves in terms of those who are funding to keep our lights on, or those who are ensuring that we are able to move from one place to the other. We need a strategy to deal with the, the issues confronting the energy sector. Are you we suggesting that strategy is not in place? Well, whatever strategy is, is in existence, it's an indication that it's still not working. If we still uh, have the issues that we are having and what currently PRC and ECG is having and what currently within the downstream, the issues that the various uh, players are having with our regulators. And I think it's about time that we also look at how regulatory institutions are constituted and the powers bestowed on them and who are appointed to run this institution. There are many a time that regulatory institutions, especially those dealing with some of the uh, state enterprises, feel that they are powerful than even the, re the regulator. And this is where we need to. It's something that happens within the upstream. It happens the downstream, whereby in our case, the regulator cannot deal with some institutions that are state run, whereby the individuals at those institutions think that they are even powerful than the personalities in charge of the regulatory organizations. And it keep on playing back and forth. Anyway, uh, so, so from there, I mean, uh, interesting take. We also know that LPG workers, uh, that association and the OMCs have rejected an $80 levy uh, imposed by the MPA. They've described it as insent insensitive and a disincentive uh, to doing a business and to the household use of LPG. Uh, again, we know that the leadership of the Concerned Drivers Association has called the bluff of uh, the Transport Ministry, but that is in a, a different uh, issue. So. 
On this bit about the $80 levy by the NPA, um, what, what is your initial take on it? $80 imposed by the NPA. The NPA has cited the circumstances leading to this, but the LPG Workers Association is saying it, it's simply unbearable. It is a disincentive, basically, for doing business. What is your take on this matter? I think uh, the regulator needs to engage further with the players down there. I've seen a letter written by the LPG Marketing Association. They may have a case uh, in how they want to deal with the issue with regarding the regulator. There are also other aspects that some of our members who have also made a similar investment in there that they were somehow compared by the regulator to make that investment also feel that they need to be compensated. So if you look at those who are into the cylinder recirculation and have been asked to invest in that sector, the regulator needs to find a way of compensating them. How do we do that? And I still think uh, we need to judge all a bit more to see how. Uh, uh, when you look at what they are trying to say, yes, you check if we really, as a country, want to sign up to the various COP uh, to promote LPG or green energy or green fuels, then as a country, we need to look at the taxes that are on LPG. Do we continue to subsidize a product like uh, Premix at the expense of LPG? And this is where we need maybe cabinet and the whole energy sector to review that because we really will send a delegation to COP26 and all these uh, fine things and sign up that we are really for the energy transition. And yet, between a cleaner energy and then we subsidize a dirty fuel and rather tax a cleaner energy. It's, it's, a, it's something that brings some level of inconsistency in terms of our policy on energy transition and our hurriedness in signing up to all these accords. Let's talk about, and yes, LPG, the derivative of uh, petroleum and all of that, but oil prices... Uh, across the world are going higher and higher. Yes, we produce some, but in the end, because of the quantum of what we bring in, it's, it, it, I mean, it doesn't add much to the, the kitty. Then we also have what is happening now, the tensions in the Middle East, Israel, Iran, and everything in there, which is also spiking the prices of fuel uh, one more time. What, how concerned are you in respect of this? Because then... It also impacts even transportation and all that. But from the bottom, as far as uh, your outfit is concerned, why is this so problematic? It's, uh, it's problematic in the sense that, one, uh, we normally would want to believe that as a country we produce oil. But unfortunately, all our barrels have been seeded into the various agreements, whereby even the ones that we have, our stake in them, is not that significant to be able to change the dynamics. And many a times we allow ourselves to be tickled and think that we are a dominant player within this international global market. We are not. We were promised uh, that G4O was going to help reduce prices of petroleum products. And we keep on reminding them that these are international commodities that you know what you are, uh, what you are buying, be it at Platts or at whatever, uh, platform that you are, you are sourcing your product from. And it is not determined by a country like Ghana. And you check even our demand profile compared to our neighbors like Nigeria and others. There are others who demand, uh, who, uh, demand more or use more fuels than even we do. So we are just uh, price takers. Whatever is out there is what we are able to purchase. Another thing that is also affecting us is our ability to manage our currency. Our currency has not been that stable. And this is where we have an issue with sometimes uh, the prices that goes out there. We currently have a situation on our hand where the regulator claims to have set uh, floor pricing. A floor pricing using an exchange rate of 13.23 or something, which you and I know that when you go to the market, it's not like, uh, the exchange rate is way different from that. The same issue that ECG is having with PRC with regards to how 
the exchange rate for their payments are going to be made. We have a critical problem and until we are able to fix, fix the exchange rate issue, we'll continue to be moved in the direction that we are going. In addition to that is somehow regulatory inconsistency at the local level. You look at the turmoil that especially the downstream sector have even faced as an industry. In the last two or so years, uh, we bear the brunt of the city jumping from six to 13 cities at a point in time, and then moving to about 17 cities, and then coming down to 18, eight cities in December 2022. All these changes happen within this same space. If you are to check the number of initiatives that has happened, the G4 now uh, LPG tendering, and then currently what we have with uh, other policies, zonalization, and other things, that within this space, it, it really does not inure to the benefit of business, also being paid by the exchange rate. So when you are encountering all these global issues that as a country we don't have control over, and then the issues that we have control over is the rate at which we change our policies are also not in near to the business community. Clearly, there, uh, there is uh, a problem that creates the situation that uh, those in charge are not being sensitive to those conducting business. And if we continue like this, we are going to lose out big time. Speaking of losing out big time, just a quick thought. You mentioned G4O, gold for oil. And you said, you suggested, I just want clarity on that, that maybe it hasn't lived up to expectation. Because just today, we're also reading that the central bank's governor was suggesting that we may have to go back to gold for oil um, as the city continues uh, to weaken. What then do you feel has been the effect of gold for oil? Has it lived up to expectation? A gold for oil is still in operation. We it is, but... but, but it's still uh, in operation. The central bank is saying that it may have to ramp it up uh, to deliver the sort of results because of the weakening city. And I'm saying that in, in this period, has it lived up to expectation in the first place? Well, I think uh, as an industry player, we are all seeking to see the. Uh, we've been waiting for the review to look at the numbers and the data to really be able to predict and then lay claim to data driven than the political rhetoric that has gone with the policy. In that sense, if we are to have uh, data back evidence that this was the rate at which the currency was going and that had it not been this, this could have happened. Also, is it a situation that they are thinking of a situation whereby they are revamping the whole policy to ensure that the, the private sector will also get equal access to the benchmark rate that they normally will provide the state entity who is more or less the one driving the good for oil. In that case, it will, will all see the benefit and be able to lay claim that indeed, we are all not sourcing dollars from the OP market. And that once we all can see our cities to the central bank, we'll all be allocated a certain uh, quantities of good purchase in order to pay our uh, international partners offshore that we've been dealing with. And that is something that we've been looking for and seeking to see how best we can align to ensure that the overall goal to uh, ensure city stability is uh, something of interest to us. But as, as we are speaking now, Yes, but, but, but even, uh, even, even before you proceed, you're talking about the facts and the figures. We may not have all of that available to us, but from what you see, since Gold for Oil started being implemented till now, and the, the gains, I mean, you remember initially when it, it was started and the, the gains, the, the, the appreciation of the CD, it was quickly related to that. I remember the vice president, among others, talking about the fact that Gold for Oil was working. What, what then has happened between then and now? The, the dollar has risen to almost 14. Again, the pound is over 16 to uh, the Ghana city. That is why I pose that question to you. Do you need to have the crystal ball of a report before you see what is happening? No, but that is why I think, uh, that is why I also was emphatic that uh, the political rhetoric around the good for it was to create the st uh, stability of the city. 
and I'm saying that the program is still ongoing. So nothing has changed, and that prices of petroleum products are going up. You talk about the international prices going up, and I'm saying that whereas good for oil is an internal mechanism that you want to use to control that, you still do not control the external factors as to how international prices of a petroleum products are going. That is not within our remit as a country to be able to control that. In addition to that, there are other uh, uh, variables that causes the prices of, of the product at the pump to go up. One is the exchange rate. As you said, if we were all made to believe that the good for oil stabilized the currency and it's still in session and it's still going on, BOS is still being given that number of uh, Lakans, uh, more than 50% uh, of the Lakans available to the industry. And yet the currency is still depreciating. Clearly, it tells you that there are other factors that really push that. And you cannot necessarily single out a particular uh, policy as being the good, uh, as being the best uh, situation. And that we should look out for all the variables and seek how best we can address it. The danger that we fall ourselves, we may play our hands into is that we may look at one issue and over magnify its significance or its importance. That may de derail us and prevent us from looking at the broader picture that really affects our currency. And that is why we are saying that we need the data back solution and not just a mere political rhetoric. For you as the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors, uh, what pricing challenges have you faced within this window in terms of procuring the petroleum needed for your business? What challenges have you faced in terms of pricing? Well, the issue that we have currently is uh, the in, uh, indication that I gave you about what the regulator has come up with uh, or the floor pricing mechanism. You can see that in pricing of petroleum products, a cost element like premiums, which is supposed to be part of your computation, is not. We are not necessarily pushing for anything, but at least the regulator have access to all the data of how the products are landed. And we were expecting that at least they could have used something in the form of a weighted average of the premiums that the product were landed in trying to give an indicative figure as to how the market is supposed to look like. In that case, you are looking at all, uh, all the cost component associated with it. Another thing that is like we are tickling ourselves and then uh, laughing is that uh, we use 13, an exchange rate of 13.23, which you all know that with the exception of Bank of Ghana auctioning, that you are going to get a, a, a percentage, maximum percentage that you will get for the market is like 20% of that. So we we're also expecting that in addition to even that as 20% of the demand for dollars in the in the system, we're looking at can they use the average between the BOG rate and then even the interbank rate to get something closer to the market or even Bloomberg rate, which is also internationally accepted so that mm. we can get an indicative value that give confidence in those who are supplying that. Indeed, even if I'm pricing along these uh, price floor mechanism with, with a little or no margin, I'm able to break even. That gives confidence to those who are uh, lending to the market and then those who are also opening up credit avenues so that they know that at least it's, they are able to do a full cost recovery. But as it stands now, we are not, uh, the numbers that we are seeing does not necessarily auger well for business and it makes it difficult for us to break even or to even be able to meet our commitment, not to talk about even profit. And what then is your forecast going forward? Do you expect things to be any better? You've already spoken about G4O uh, and the fact that it, it probably isn't yielding the results that we expected, even as the Bank of Ghana hopes to ramp it up on that. What then would be your, your forecast going forward? When our forecast is, one, we want to know what uh, the Bank of Ghana or the 
Bank of Ghana or the government intend to do with regards to the go for oil to know how it intend to ramp up the uh, other aspect of it, other aspect of the uh, private sector that has not necessarily benefiting from the same rate that our boss is getting and see how best we can all contribute to ensure it. That is the, the only hope on ensuring that the city becomes stable. We want to see how best we can do that. We also intend engaging the regulator to use the required numbers that is indicative from the market, something closer to the market to also give a fair assessment of what the situation is like, to give confidence to those who uh, offer credit lines to our members to conduct our trading. We hoping that the issues that are external to us that we cannot control will be a bit stabilized and the international tension can come down to ensure we have also a stable international prices to ensure we are able to conduct business in a safer environment. Uh, your thoughts on this, though, that latest directive in terms of uniform prices, the oil marketing companies and their products, uh, what, what does that do? What, what is your reading of that? I know you may not directly be in the line, but uh, these uniform prices, some have said, it's, it's a free market. I mean, if we're going to price it, someone is going to price it at 11, another person is going to price it at 13, let the consumers decide. What's your take? Well, you look at, uh, I'm looking at the SL sheet that they used to, granted that there are still some elements within there that gives individual uh, marketing or individual companies to set. That is your margin. You can decide to net off your margin. It still offers some room for individuals to decide. So it's not that really controlled. But that is why I'm saying that the formula that provide the basis for it should be realistic and should be close to the market so that even if the individuals want to play around with their numbers and then you, they want to be rewarded for their negotiation skills, they should have that room to do that. But currently, assistance, it does not necessarily represent how the market is. And if there is a danger for others not to even attempt to price using this as a benchmark. And then the likely consequences of also being hit by international price and exchange rate because you still feel that the moment the regulator has given these numbers and you are you cannot mark those numbers. There is danger that there is that danger that you have to wait and see how you price in the coming window. And that you also continue to expose yourself to the international and exchange rate, which you hardly can have control over. Any final thoughts on this matter as we uh, cap off the conversation? Any parting shots for us? I think uh, the government and the regulatory institutions need to be fair to uh, business operators and then listing more than what the, uh, some of the things that we are doing. We, we know they intend implementing a lot of policies, but they should also look at the context in which we are in the global perspective and how businesses have performed over the years before they come up with it. You look at the charges from all the levies from Ghana Standard, uh, Ghana Standard Authority levies and everything, and then uh, property rates for terminals and all these variables that affect our businesses have been increased some by 400%. And I don't think it's really fair and crazy the best enabling environment for uh, private sector. Doc, thank you so much for joining the conversation. That is uh, Dr. Patrick Ofori, CEO, Chamber of Bulk Oil uh, Distributors. He joined the conversation. Now, when we return from the break, we're also going to be contemplating that situation to do with the Concerned Drivers Association. Uh, they are calling the bluff of the transport uh, ministry and also even passengers. They are saying, listen, we can't continue taking the hit. Push has come to shove. We must translate the prices to uh, the consumers. But what can we expect on that? We'll be taking you to a fuel station shortly for some live interactions on the AM show. We'll be right back.
Welcome back on the AM show. We now contemplate uh, the case of fuel prices, among others, and the drivers' unions and their contestation. They basically want an increment in uh, these uh, prices so that they can break even and at least uh, make a profit. Now, they're also calling the bluff of the transport ministry, which is daring the police to uh, arrest them for increasing their transport fares by some 20%. You know, there's been a back and forth increase to increase or not to increase, and some actually going ahead uh, to increase them. Well, joining us uh, via phone this morning, we have the General Secretary of the GPRTU in the person of Gottfried Abulbeda. He joins the conversation. Uh, good morning, sir. It appears we've lost him. Uh, we'll try to reconnect with him. But it has to do with that long-standing, continuous issue. The transport operator is saying we can no longer deal with the situation. Fuel prices are up. The cost of spare parts is up. You have lubricant prices shooting up. You have DVLA insurance charges shooting up, among others. We are up to our eyebrows and we can no longer take it. But on the other hand, you have consumers on the streets who are also saying the economy is poor, the economy is bad, and we cannot afford to do anything more in terms of transport fares. But where do we go from here? We have uh, Godfrey back on the line. Uh, thank you so much for joining the conversation, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's good to have you. Now, we know yes, that in recent days, there's been a lot of talk about increasing prices or not. There's been talk about engaging the transport ministry. What has been the engagement of the GPRTU so far with the transport ministry? Well, I believe uh, 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 what you've mentioned are all right. We, there's some uh, serious anxiety for fair increments as a result of the fuel price hikes. So we held a meeting with the minister last Wednesday. And then uh, the factors we had presented to him was the post we looked at so that today by 12 o'clock we reconvene and then we conclude on uh, the margin we think we can uh, adjust our face. Now you say there will be a conclusion sometime today on the margins, but we also know that some of these transport operators have already started implementing this. Are you, have you caught wind of that? Yes, we, we are aware. I believe uh, quite a handful of them have done some, some with, uh, at uh, Cape Coast, some at, uh, I believe, Takradi. And then uh, that such information got to us, and then we called on the regional chairman to uh, stop that action until we, we conclude on our fair negotiation. In the interim, yes. how are your drivers reacting? You are, you are helming the largest uh, operators group in Ghana. How are your yes. drivers reacting? On the back of the very things I mentioned, I will reiterate, yes. you know better than I do, fuel prices. Spare part yes, prices, yeah, yeah. lubricants, it's, it's, insurance, it's a very good question. It's a very, see, their, their reactions are just said that they even believe leadership is uh, tying with, uh, the, 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 with the ministry. They believe they you are, are in bed with government. They are now having the suspicion that maybe we are, they are not dialoguing to their interests with the ministry because uh, sometimes... The delays in reaching the decision is what made them uh, 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 lose their patience and then they act in that manner. Mm. Hello, Mr. Mr. Abubri, are you, are you still with us? I'm with you. I, I lost the, the end part of what you were saying. I, I, I said that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the delays in reaching the decisions at our meetings that made them lose they are patients, and then they act in that manner. But I believe for today, we'll reach a conclusion. You'll reach a conclusion today. We are adjusting okay. by the 10%, by 20%, or whichever margin that we think we conclude. Okay. I'll come back to you. Hold for me. Let me also bring in David Aguado. He is a PRO for the Concerned Drivers Association. Mr. Aguado, okay. a very good morning to you. Good morning, my brother. Right. Now... There have been some unions that have gone ahead to have some increments. Uh, the CCTGH has come into the picture at a point, and uh, among others. But 
We also know that while the GPRTU often represents the bigger faction, you, the concerned drivers, sometimes step out on your own. Um, do you subscribe or are you partaking in the meeting today uh, with the GPRTU and the Transport Union? Are you going to be there as well? My people will be there, but I, David, will not be there. The concern will be part of it, the meeting. Okay, I just wanted, I mean, the concern drivers. So the group will be there. It will be represented. Hello, Mr. Aguado. Yes, sir, my boss. Okay, so the group will be represented, though you will not be there. Yes. Now, I do know that in terms of the percentage requirements, you may have heard Mr. Abubere just make mention of the fact that today there must be some conclusion, whether 10%, 20%, or whatever. But I also know that you don't necessarily agree with the GPRT on some of these sticking points. So for you, the concerned drivers, what is a workable percentage and what is not? The workable percentage is 20%. Workable is 20%? 20. Yes. Yeah. Nothing less than 20%? Come again. Nothing less than 20%? Nothing less than 20% because... We have already started with the 20%, and we are ongoing. We are taking it today as I'm speaking to you. It's still ongoing. The 30%, the 20% is working perfectly, and we are taking it. But based on uh, what Mr. are you? Mr. Based Mr. on Mr. what are you using the 20%? You know the process. Based on what yes. are you applying the 20%? Exactly. So the process are we have five components that we use in determine the price. Lubricants have gained 85%. Spare parts, over 100%. A cost of a car, over 100%. Stationary and printing, that's the insurance, DVLA, everything, have gained 45%. T and where, the tires and other things, the batteries and other things, have gained more than 75%. Before the fuel, after the fuel, I don't want to talk about it. I don't I want to argue with the fuel. Within this very year, from January to now, they have increased fuel six consecutive times. For that one, I don't want to add it to it. But the component that I just mentioned, all of them have gained tremendous interest in it. And the price is outrageous. But we, the commercial transport operators, are coping with it. As Mr. Bubri just said, that yes, the delay of the ministry not complying with GPRTU rules. Do you know why GPRTU have some clause in their constitution? That's 2K. Tell them that when, uh, the, when all the transport operators have agreed to increase transport fare, GPRTU should sit with the appropriate government authority. That is in their clause, not the rest of the transport operators clause is only GPRTU clause that carries that clause. So, yes, GPRTU can go and go and talk. But the right thing is that we are due to charge our 20%, as Mr. Abu Brija said, because the drivers see the Takrade are under them, the Sunyani are under them, Kumasi is under them, Northern region is under them. I'm talking of in terms of GPRTU. But those people all have increased their transport fares. They are under GPRTU. But they have increased their transport fares because of the delay. And people think the hierarchy, the top hierarchy, are in bed with the government. It is not so. But the delay of the ministry to act on his mandate, that is what is causing the whole thing. So if this is what you're saying, then why are you attending the meeting today? You've already gone ahead and you're saying that your clauses do not in, in, you know, force you or compel you to adhere to this meeting before you increase your prices. Why then are you partaking in the meeting today? We must be there and see and hear what goes on over there. And we will also add our voice to the voice of GPI to you to make it solid. Mr. Agbado, hold for me. Um, Mr. Abubira, uh, what is your reaction to this? Because there is some suggestion that, look, you, you keep saying this and there's been no increment, but some of your members have actually gone ahead uh, to push for this increment. What's your reaction? 
But I was speaking to you on, on when you were on his side. I was not hearing the comments that he was saying, so that I can be able to respond properly. So I heard him uh, slightly saying that uh, they, he, his members will be represented. I don't know by which particular group. But what I know is that it's GPRTU and then the GRTCC who are going to do this fair negotiation today. Concern no matter what I have not been part, and I don't think today they will be part. I see. But he was saying that they would be represented. In no, any... it, it, I don't know what by the representation he's referring to is what I don't know yet. But I'm saying that we are going to do our discussions today. And then, at all costs, we'll conclude and come out. If they think they, they, they can't go by us, then they should have gone ahead to increase their 20% that I mentioned it. But, but, but also that's what he's saying. 20%. But the, when we get there, we cannot say that uh, the factors we have laid before them, and then the calculations end up something less than that, we say we'll not take it. We are also dealing with human beings. But Mr. Abubar, he is saying that they have gone ahead with their 20%. Did you hear that? I didn't, that's what I didn't also hear him properly. That's why I was signaling you to let Okay, me, so let me take it uh, with you one by one so we don't go back and forth. He's saying, and uh, Mr. Yeah. Aguado, you can confirm, you have already gone ahead with your 20%, right? Mr. Aguado, can you hear me? I can hear you. Have you already you. started implementing the 20%? Yes, I have already. We have already implemented implement the 20 percent all right so mr abubar you, you you've heard him he says they've already started implementing their 20 percent mr abubar are you with me i am with you but i don't know then what is the significance of <laughs> being part of the business today again yes and 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 that is the same question i posed uh, to him yes but he says yes. he makes the point he makes the point that it is only you the gpr to you you yes. are bound per your constitution and other, yes. you know, legal requirements, to be in these meetings and then you are restricted. You have to attend these meetings and judge all before you can implement. But he says they are not. Is that, is that correct or not? I, I believe he's speaking with reverse our constitution, which is not his constitution. But he shouldn't say that we are banned by it, no. If he's, he, if he's aware, there have been about twice or so that we have reviewed a lot of us without recourse to that particular uh, 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 protocol. So he should not talk as if the constitution bans us automatically to do and do that uh, fair division. What he's saying, I believe, was in one, I don't know the current constitution or whatever, but it is not mandatory that we must go there. It is not. Okay, so. so so then uh, they have already gone ahead and he talks about this bit but he also talks about the fact that some of your people have also in other places have also moved ahead with increments are, are you uh, yes, aware, I aware of that? That that. yes i have heard that and then we have reminded those who have done that we've called such regions as the central and whether and to what uh, bring the fair back to where it was until we come out officially with the agreed percentage it's true that uh, some others have gone ahead and then we are asking them to reverse. But, but it means some of them, even now, are still implementing that, right? We are not too sure. But, uh, for the areas where the minister had and mentioned to us, we've compelled them to go back to the old first. Mm. So your expectation is that... Ashama, Mr. Mr. Ashama, Mr. Etc. So we have to contact the chairman there and then ask it to reverse. I think uh, that has been done. All right. In concluding the conversation, I'll start with you, Mr. Aguado. There has been talk about, um, Duncan Amua, for example, has said that, look, 10 to 15 percent is, is reasonable on the back of the happenings. You have gone ahead to increase by 20 percent. Um, how do you justify it, especially as you're saying you are not even bound by what will happen between, uh, you know, the parties that are meeting today? Uh, then, then why even attend that meeting? Mm -hmm. That's my final bit to you. I can suggest 15%. Deeply to you, I heard my learned colleague, Dr. Aboburi, saying, yes, they, can, they are dealing with women. Yes, we are all dealing with women. But Abusu Khan people are also dealing with women. They charge abysmally prices when you are going to back the past. So for them, yes, 
That is to them. But because we are buying the pack and we are selling it to the consumers, we, must, we are selling it with conscience that at least the 20% is good. Because we can go more than the 20%. If you, even if you ask my friend, Dr. Dabubri, he will tell you that yes, the 20% even, they are not going there with 20%, or they are going there with more than 20%, and they are going to bargain and come to a, a conclusion of either 20 or 25 or 10 or 15. So that tells you they are not going there with 20% alone. They are going more than that. But the 20%, I think, is good for all of us. So you're going to stick to your 20%? Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Aguado. Let me bring in Mr. Abubere uh, for your final thoughts. Yes. Well, I think uh, my final thoughts are just about what I said earlier. You know, when you, you are asked to justify the 20% that you are, you, are, you are mentioning, and you want to go by the calculations what we do use at that place there, I don't know how he can justify the figures we normally use doesn't rely on all the factors, but the factors that have seen increment. It's not about just mention all the, the components that determine uh, uh, transfer operations, it's about the factors that have seen increments. Like we talked about what? Spare parts. And the spare parts, basically, when dollar goes up, it affects all spare parts. But he and gave you the percentages. He mentioned each, each component. And by how much? Some 80% and all of that. What, what does that translate into? Every okay. core component has gone up in price. Yes. Anyway. The core components, if they have gone up. Mm. Mr. Abubre, we're grateful for your time. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll have subsequent engagement after uh, the conclusion of that meeting uh, later today. So we were joined by the PRO of the Concerned Drivers Association in the person of David Aguado as well as Mr. Godfred Abubira, he's General Secretary of the GPRTU. Stay with us, we'll be right back after this break. Welcome back on the AM show. Now, I don't know, um, are you, if you're a man, of course, are you bald, muscled, pot-bellied, skinny? I don't know in which category you fall. I think I'll be finding out from Kofi Hayford, who joins me in the studio, about in which category uh, he thinks I uh, fall. But it's all about the fifth installment, the fifth season of BMPS. If you've never caught it on Joy Prime, You've been missing out a big time. And we have the host right here in uh, the studio. I see you put yourself under the P category, which is the pot well, yeah. category. Some, some people say I, I would actually um, also fit for the role of the bald. But really, I have hair. Charlie, <laughs> can't you see? Can't you see? Like, <laughs> Let me see the hair again. Let me oh, come on, come on. You want to touch it? Uh, no, let me turn, turn to the side. Like let me this? see something. Okay, we can make a case for you. Yeah. We I can mean, make a case I, I don't for exactly you. qualify to be bald. Okay. Maybe in the next 10 years, but not In now. the next 10 years. But he is host, Kofi Eiffel is host of the BMPS uh, show. Uh, how did this, I, I'm just curious. I know what went into this, but mm -hmm. this is a boys, boys, men, it's men a boys, boys, show. Men, Tell men us about it. Conversation. Shouts to Victor Brache. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Victor is in London now, but he came up with this very brilliant idea mm. of having a, an all-male panel talk show. It's a lifestyle show that focuses on talking about everything from social issues to religious issues to financial issues to politics to everything, but from a very light perspective and also from a male's, you know, um, point of view. Okay. So, Women are it's not just like when boys boys meet, right? What do they talk about? What do we talk about? Everything that men talk about. Okay. Everything that men talk about, you know, when they meet. Right. And when I say this, what I mean is there are certain conversations that we do have in, in private, which people think should not be 
had outside. Right. Uh -huh. So these are some of the conversations that we have. Um, can't always, say uh, we yeah, can't say pa, Polo. Pa, pa, and, 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 and I like the fact that you just spoke to you because one thing that I've always said on almost all the seasons is that people say, right? Men are expected to um, water down their true feelings. But how do we really feel about issues? Mm. So we created this haven, safe haven, for men to discuss everything off the top of their to chest. To vent. To vent everything. Okay. So, that, so that's what we do on the BMW. I'm not going to let you run away from this. Before we get into, I mean, season four was mind-blowing, right, exciting. Right. I don't know what you have in, in store for us in season five. But better, even when better. you look at me, I'm um, just wondering whether I would fit anywhere on your show. Uh, Bald? No. Uh, muscled? Uh -huh. I don't know whether you would say that I'm necessarily <laughs> we, we might muscled. I'm okay. saying my diet working out. Uh, uh, yeah, you artist. know, because I, knew, I know you used to have, you know, some really bald chest. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're not bald, you're not muscled, you're not pot-bellied, and you're not really skinny as well. But let me tell you what, you still qualify to be on the show, and that's one good thing that season five is introducing. Okay. We have decided that there are also men who do not necessarily fall in these categories of men that we have, you know, talked about. And so we're going to have them as guests on the show in season five. Wow. So you qualify wow. to be on so the show. So we're breaking ground. Yes. I can come on board. Yeah, you can, uh... you can. In fact, I'm giving you an official invitation to okay. be on the BNPA okay. show season Hook five. Hook me up one of these yeah, days. I'll yeah, show I up. Will. I will. We'll do our thing. I will. Yeah. I will. So There's you're clarity on who I am. So <laughs> as a man, I'll show up. <laughs> I know. But, but, but then what are going to be some of the hot topics you're going to be discussing it, in season five? It's, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> Because boys, boys, there we never like topics know, to talk I about. So I've been thinking about it because then I was asking myself, Charlie, this is morning TV. Do you want to discuss all of the things that you know you really want to discuss when you meet? <laughs> but even before we go into what we're going to be discussing in season five, in season four, for example, we're asking, mm. will you agree to an open relationship with your partner? For where? <laughs> <laughs> so you open know, for where? And then we also we also discussed a man who is into his looks. Do you just call him flashy or you think it's self-care? I mean, I think it's, it's borderline, right? There are some people who are so in love with themselves, it's dangerous. It's mm. called narcissism. Mm -hmm. Then they love, it's like they Everything. love themselves Everything. too much. And, and you know that is always to the detriment yes, of, yes, of the other person. Right. So I think it's borderline. It depends on loving yourself. Look, as a man, you must look trim. Neat, mm. smell good, mm. and all of that. Mm. What has here? You are getting into it. This if is, you are this not, is, this is not a BMP yeah, show. Relax. This is what has here. Relax when you come but, on it. But some <laughs> do go. I mean, we all see them from time to time. You yeah. see this one is like Charlie. This guy, why? You know they go well. Why? Yeah, I feel lip sync crap. Why? Just say why? Yeah, no, who be be be? What that day inside? I know, I know. What day So, for example, for the premiere of season five tomorrow, we're okay. looking at what do men really consider before popping the big question to oh. be a woman. Will you marry will me? Will you marry me? What do we really look out for? Give me one thing you will look out for. Or Catch you me tomorrow to... on the premiere of the BNPA show. <laughs> this guy is playing, he's playing very safe <laughs> <laughs> on, on this bit. I see. AI is something that has popped up, right? Um, I mean, students these days are using AI. And sometimes... And some I, are getting caught. Yeah. I mean, it's not about getting caught. I, for one, if you want my very personal view, it is great. It's such a great tool to use in school, right? But I also think it's making a lot of our colleagues in school very, very lazy. So, AI in today's world, is it a friend or a foe? Okay. It's something we're looking at in season five. And boys, boys will know. Boys, boys will know. Because, because boys, boys exactly. are doing stuff. Exactly. Charlie, I'm loving you know. this already. I, so should, we're having, I should take a seat. <laughs> you should. Oh, no, to be very honest. Okay, so we're going on set actually tomorrow okay. uh, to film other episodes. We've already started shooting. So, yeah, I mean, we can have you if the time works best for you. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. But let's talk about sponsorship. I mean, mm. these shows usually come with a lot of pressure, true. financial true. pressure, true. logistical true. pressure. We need the backing of some entities. That's true. Let, let's shout out those that are helping us. So, shouts first of all to Joy Prime. <laughs> because, of course, without Joy Prime, there is yeah. no BMP yeah. show. So, shouts to Joy Prime, shouts to Emily and the entire team, to our producer, um, Brenda, IB, and all the technical guys. Um, shouts to them. We also want to say special shouts to Johnny Walker. Keep walking. And I like their tagline because then every time we go on the BMP show, we're reminded that re re regardless of whatever we're going through, you need to keep walking. It doesn't right. matter how difficult it gets, do not stop. Keep walking. 
And so, um, shouts to Johnny Walker, um, especially their uh, Black Label Big Bold flavor. They are actually helping us to come your way with it. Um, yeah. I also want to say shouts to Jakarta Fashion uh, because, well, throughout the season, they will be clothing me for all, wow. almost all the 13 episodes. I like the way to... it was communal and then all of a sudden it became individual. <laughs> I, know, right. me. Charlie, I know, Charlie, right. Charlie, Charlie. I know, right. I, <laughs> I see. Yeah. And um, you've already mentioned, but I, you're having some guests pass through the yes, season, Yes, we'll, right? we will have some guests. Special guests. I mean, I'm sure that we would want to have you. So if you can make the time, mm. um, just pass through. Let's have a conversation. Um, but just clarify, I know uh, there's been a change in airing time. Yes, yes, date. yes. There's been a change Let's in airing time. I'll, I'll touch on that just briefly. But before that, let me also announce that we will be having replacements for some of the characters. Okay. Right? Just so we can have diversity in opinions. A refreshing look. Exactly. A refreshing look. So, for example, in one of the episodes, you're going to see maybe just three of us without Nanye. And then at other times, you see Nanye. Then at other times... We'll have a replacement for Possible or Modded Rock. There is one guy called Eric Intiamwa who has very interesting views. He will also be on the show. You know, so we will be, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know if you grow a little bit of pot belly. Maybe you can replace me for, it, for, for an episode or two. Okay. But yes, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, airing time, the airing time used to be on Fridays. Right. Um, now there is another brilliant show on Fridays uh, by okay. KMJ. Uh, on a more serious note, shouts to KMJ and Martin and the entire team. So now BMPS has been moved to Thursdays, okay. 9 p.m. And the great news, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's no more 30 minutes. We heard your cry. Uh, the conversation gets very interesting. And just when it's peaking, we close the show because it's time. So now, so now we have extended it to an hour. So you have all the time to digest all the conversations that we bring on board. Wow. There are two more things that we're introducing. Please note it down. We're coming up with the boys code of the week. Okay. Boys code or the bro code of the week. Okay. What's that one thing, that motivation that men need to keep going and never stop? We're going to do that. And then also this time we're going onto the streets, do a vox pop and find out exactly what people think about the issues that we are going to be discussing on the BMPS show. So what do men really think about or what do they consider before popping the big right. question? You'd hear from the streets. What do people think? And the views and opinions of the people, my goodness. I wish we could use only that for the show. <laughs> very interesting views. Very, very, very interesting So views. you're going to be doing more viewer interaction. You know, yeah. You know, yeah, of course. on the streets and exactly. all of that. And then not also, just you guys sitting not in just the studio. Us, not, we, we want right. it to be all inclusive. Right. So we are also doing, in season five, we've started doing polls on social media to find out what you think. Right? And... and read your comments and what have you. We're doing all of that. You've sold it on me. Um, just in some 30 seconds, encourage uh, 30 our, seconds. Our, our viewers to come along. All right. So before I encourage you, let me also say a big thanks to the entire cast. I'm talking about myself. Shouts to me. Shouts to Possible. <laughs> Nanaya Possible representing the skinny. Shouts to um, Oliver Moded Rock representing uh, the muscle. And of course, to our brother Nanya Kofi, who is representing the board. And shouts to all the... Um, uh, men, all the, the brilliant men who will be on the show for season five of the BMPS show. Please, if you haven't caught it before, for the uninitiated, um, the bald, muscled, pot-bellied and skinny show, that's what BMPS represents. And we look at things from a man's perspective. So even if you're a woman, please, we, you are the ones that actually need the show. Just come into our world and understand everything that we say and everything that we think about with regards to issues. It's on Thursdays at 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. It's premiering tomorrow, the 18th of April, 2024, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. I want to say a big thanks to the entire team, IB, Brenda, um, Marie, Livia, Nanaya, all our social media guys, and all the technical team, Azu and the like. And shout-outs to Samuel McAfee as well. And shout-outs to you. Kofi, thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming. One thanks of these days, I'm me. going to surprise you. You're really it's all about BMPS. Fifth season premiering tomorrow, Studios of Joy Prime, 9 to 10 p.m. You want to catch that. Even if you're not bald, muscled, pot-bellied, or skinny, come along. You just might find something interesting. We'll be right back on the AM show.
Welcome back on the AM show. It is my pleasure to give you, as we cap off the show, the inter-school reading uh, quiz. Reading is my thing, so I get excited about it. And we have a host of students, pupils, in the studio this morning. But let me first introduce Thelma Parker, who is marketing and brands manager for the inter-school uh, reading quiz. And it's the finals coming up. Yes. Thelma, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine, thank you. I'm excited to be here with my wonderful cups. <laughs> oh, yes, and uh, quite a number of cubs. Look at the smiles on their faces and all. Yeah? And we also have so the Golden Angels represented in that corner, and then uh, Theoro's school represented in this corner. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Yes. Or should I do it for you? Uh, Which one? I would love to. <laughs> okay, so you, you go ahead. I know there's um, me, Ashi, among others. Tell us your name. We want, we want to hear from you. What's your full name? My full name is Niashi Yijemo Nipe. Okay, okay. And what's your name? My name is Delaina Kofi Hiagbe Jr. Okay, and his name? Franklin Asanyo Kwapon. All right, so let's pause the microphone. Let me hear from you first. What's your name? My name is Grace Apia. Grace Apia. And you are? My name is Ravna Kwantin Asanti. Oh, and you are? My name is Gloria Apia. Gloria Apia. Are, are you, are you yes. sisters? Yes, yes. Hey, this is a tag team. I mm. tell you. Wow. Okay, so let's find out what is this concept about and how far have you come in terms of this inter-schools uh, reading quiz? Right, thank you so much. Um, so inter-school reading quiz is organized by Peppy Cups, that's the name of the organization, right. in collaboration with UNESCO's Accra World Book Capital. So in 2023, the title was here in Accra with regards to World Book Capital, right? And so since then, we've been going to so many schools, both public and private schools. We have 21 public schools in the competition, right, from what we call the qualification stage. And then we have 30 private schools as well. And all these schools, all the children in these schools have been reading very, very, very hard mm. in order to be in, at this stage of the competition. And these are our finalists. So from 50 schools down to 20 schools, then 12 schools, then um, 8 to 4, and then we have two schools represented in the finals. So these are the two schools as these standing. Are the two schools. What have they done to merit being here? Just Reading. give us a fair idea. Reading. So we have what we call the Peppy Cups Digital Library. On there, there are a variety of books from science fiction to all sorts of books, all, all sorts of genres, and they've been reading um, all through to get to this stage. And yes, so the competition has been from what we call the audition, where we did the screening to see which, which of the schools have been reading. And then we went to the round of 16 of the group stages. They qualified. They qualified then to the quarterfinals and then to the semifinals. And here they are in the finals. They've, they've been reading. They don't, they don't sleep, they tell me. So. You don't sleep. Hey, everybody <laughs> they sleeps all. They to Canada. That's the prize. And I know, that's the Canadian dream. <laughs> the Canadian, like, so they are very close. Who to wants to go to Canada? <laughs> The competition is heated. Who will go? I think go? the girls' hands went up faster <laughs> than your hands did. Who wants to go to Canada? Okay. So let's find out whether you really mean it. You are one quiz away from that. How prepared are you? Let me start with me. How prepared are you guys for the grand finale? Well, well when we qualified for the final, we have, we have set our minds and... We know that this is a very, very big opportunity for all of us. So we have been reading non-stop. Because we're on vacation, sometimes we come to school to read. Sometimes we get quizzed a lot. Sometimes in the house, we do all-nighters, trying to read. All-nighters? Yes, all we holding vigils, hmm. yes. reading vigils. <laughs> yes, all night. Hey. All night. Yeah. You know, you know me joke, oh, these people reading. are not playing. Hmm. To the point that we can, when we sleep and we wake up, our eyes are red and sore, and we know that it will be worth it. When we are in Canada, we can rest. <laughs> oh, when you are in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The girls will have something to say about that, because interestingly, you also want to make it to Canada, right? Yes, please. Oh. Have your preparations been like theirs, you know, sometimes going deep into the night, burning the midnight oil? Similar to that. Hey. Charlie, the competition is it's, it's not going to be a joke. Heated, and they are very bright cups, we must say. Some of the answers they are able to provide on the days, on the con during the contest, is just amazing. We are very proud of them. And to all the schools that have equally participated, we are so proud of them. Let me come to the sisters. From both of you, how has being in this competition shaped your reading abilities? Can you please pass the microphone uh, to them? Let me start with you. It has been so awesome and exciting. Wow. Yes. 
Are you learning new words? Are you becoming yes. a better reader? Yes. So oh. nowadays, I like reading more books from Pelicast. Wow. L l let me hear from your sister as well. How many books have you read? Three hundred plus. Three hundred yes, plus. From Pebby Cups, yes. Amazing. <laughs> wow. Amazing. That that definitely will impact your reading. So, how how much have you grown in terms of reading? Do you think? That's improved my reading abilities. By a lot, huh? Mm. You're more confident now. Okay, let me come to the guys. Let me come to the guys so they don't feel that <laughs> I am leaving them out. How, how has this impacted you, participating in this? How many books have you also read? About 300 or more? More. More than 300? Yeah. Charlie, the competition is not I going to be easy. I you, and these figures are mind-blowing. You truly, they read as many books on, on Pebby Cups. Yeah. For you, what books have inspired you as far as Pebby Cups is concerned and this entire arrangement? For one, I would say Canada. <laughs> Canada itself has inspired you? Yes. Okay, going to Canada, winning and going to Canada. Yes. Okay. But in terms of the books, which ones have really resonated with you or got your interest, got you really interested? Oliver Twist. Oliver Twist. When I look at you, you want more. Eh? <laughs> That's why you want to go to Canada. Yeah. I see. I see. And, and your parents, let, let me come to you. How have your parents, you know, received all of this? Because it means a lot of pressure, sometimes sleeping late. And mm. How have your parents, have they been supportive? Yes, very supportive. Mm. They're very supportive. And they're always calling us to wish us all the best. So I really thank them for their efforts. Oh, that's so sweet. Sweet, yes. I guess all of you can give shouts to your parents, eh? Yes. What, what do you have to say to your parents? Well, I say I thank them very much. I love them for all the struggles they went through just to help me get this far. Without them, I wouldn't even be here. I wouldn't even be in Pebby Cows. But they knew what was best for me, and they pushed you. And when we win, we we'll give them the victory. I, I like how he keeps <laughs> going when. He doesn't when, say yes, if, no, he no, says no, no, when. No, no, when. The girls will have something <laughs> to say about that, though. But how about your teachers? Anyone want to talk about the teachers and how much they've impacted you. I see that smile on your face. Yes. Do you want to say anything about the teachers? No? <laughs> Who wants to talk about teachers? Yes. The teachers have really done a lot. All their efforts coming to school, even on their rest time. Like some have to be at places important, but they sacrifice to come here. Even though they are not going to the Canada, maybe they will. They have done a lot just to assure us our okay. Okay. I see. When I come back to you, I would want to find out from both sides what you would like to do when you get to Canada, what you would look forward to doing. But let me come to uh, Thelma at this point. So is the grand finale, what can we expect from the grand finale? And um, tell us about some of the prizes. Apart from going to Canada, there are other prizes, right? There are other prizes. Mm. So there is a cash prize for the winning schools. And even for the second place, um, there, there, there are cash prizes. We also have the third and fourth place. So for the schools that didn't qualify to the semifinals, they also get to get some cash prize. So it's for the schools and then for the Cups. And then we have the scholarship to the National Spelling Bee, mm. uh, which is also available for them. Trophies, product giveaway. So we are calling on more sponsors. Please come. <laughs> yeah, and, and other exciting. How can sponsors come on board? Yeah, so they can call us. We are very excited to have them on board. And we want to say a very big thank you to the current ones, the Mohinani Group and their brands, KFC and Polytank, and also to Joy Prime. But sponsors can call us on 053 520 792. You'd have to slow down so that the sponsors yes, can please, get that. Yes, number. please. Likely okay. sponsors. So 053 520 7920. Um, this is an exciting program, and we understand that in this world, a fast-changing world, um, reading, we understand, has a strong correlation to success. And so that is why we say Peppy Cup success is just a book away. So we want to encourage all parents to register and get their children on our Peppy Cups library platform. All right, so one each, representative each. I think I'll do you, and then I'll do you as a representative from there. Um, what will you do should you win the ultimate prize and go to Canada? What would you look forward to doing? I have not thought of that yet, but I would say enjoy my time there. Have a life. Have a lot of fun. Yes, have a lot of fun. Okay, let me hear from here and then uh, we can go for you. God willing, when we go to Canada, I would like to explore the beautiful landscapes and read from the Canadian libraries. Oh, that's interesting. interesting. <laughs> well, I wish both teams the very best. May the best man or woman yes. win. 
Um, and we have to go now, Thelma, maybe in some 15 seconds, final words. Thank you very much. So we have the grand finale happening this Friday, and there is going to be an award ceremony right after the finals, and right. then what we call the celebration of champions, where all the readers that have participated in this right from the very beginning, and all our children, it's a grand fanfare, full of fun. They can come on board, and then let's all have fun together and enjoy this journey of reading and Thank you, Thelma. Thank you, guys. It's all about the inter-school reading quiz uh, finals. Right before we go, though, the Royal Cozy Hotel is uh, throwing a challenge to you. Escape to Royal Cozy Hills Hotel in Drapa, Dubai. You have seen the rest. Now is the time to see the best. Take a break from work and take a break from the South. The Royal Cozy Hotels, that is Drapa, Dubai, is the place to relax, rewind, and re-energize. It is away from the stress of the South. Now, this is what awaits you. An unforgettable safari experience. Amazing array of wildlife, including lions, hippopotamuses, zebras, ostriches, among many others, using our spacious and well-secured game tour vehicles or using quad bikes. Water sports such as jet skiing, boat or canoe rides, various family games to keep you and your families excited every day. Great tourist attractions in the Upper West region, including the Mushroom Rock, Slave Caves, etc. So escape from the south, escape to the north. Escape to the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, Joppa, Dubai, for an unforgettable safari experience. Pick up your phone, give them a call. 0501-694-280 or 0248-844-463 for reservations or further inquiries now. And as we go, we'll just leave you with a picture of the day right before Aisha Ibrahim uh, brings you Joy News Desk. You want to stay uh, for that one. We take you into that community as we look at a sea of filth and uh, the picture should be popping up any time uh, now Bagbasete is that community and that is our sea of filth uh, photo for you today it's by Caleb Mensah my name is Benjamin Akako thank you for joining me on the AM show together with Sweetie Abochi join news desk up next